I would like to now call this meeting to order. Will you all please rise? Before we begin with the pledge, I would like to have a moment of silence for the lives that were lost and the trauma that was experienced by those on the west coast of Florida, please. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thanks, Marcy. Before we begin, I want to thank our amazing staff um, and our first responders for their vigilance in prepar um, preparing our city for the possible landing of Hurricane Ian at the very beginning. But as it progressed, I want to especially thank our city manager and Charlotte Przinski from Leisure Services for keeping our city services open so that while we were wondering if the storm was gonna come or not, our staff was able to bring their children to Riverside for care during the day. They made sure that there was never a hiccup in the services that our city would uh, provide and made sure that every single resident would be cared for if, if needed, as well as prepared to help our neighbors. Which brings me to the folks on the West Coast. Our city has sent Northcom dispatchers to Collier County, and now they've also sent them to Hendry County, as well as an ambulance strike team and fire rescue to Central Florida. So our hearts go out to those affected by the devastating tragedy. Thank you for your time, and will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Reed. Here. Vice Mayor Litt. Here. Council Member Woods. Here, ma'am. Council Member Marciano. Here. Council Member Tinsley. Here. Are there any additions, deletions, or modifications to the agenda tonight? Yes, ma'am, there are two. All right, so I see that the two we have is a resolution and a proclamation for a family promise week. So I'm going to ask for a motion and a second to approve these items to add them to our consent agenda. All in favor? I'll make a motion to approve. Oh, sorry, sorry. Second. And thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. So next will be uh, announcements and presentations. Ready to dig in. Let's go. First, we're going to call Jim McCartan to the podium. And if council could join me for a photograph, please. No. I guess so. Right. Oh, I can. We can. You want, you want to do the photograph first or after, Jim? Yeah. Want to do it after? Let's do it. Let's do we'll it. do it. Okay. No, oh, no, we'll, we'll do it after. I, I think that's a great idea. So here's what's going to happen. We are so thrilled tonight to honor you. You can, you can sit because you're going to want to sit for this. <laughs> and I'm going to, uh, at the very beginning of this meeting, beg everybody for your patience. We have a lot of city business tonight. We have this wonderful honoring of Jim. We have some other information we want to share with you. And then we have a pretty full agenda. So get comfortable, get cozy. We're going to be here for a little bit longer than usual tonight. So I wanted to take a moment to thank our council for sharing with us the fact that uh, Jim has made some changes in life and will be retiring. And he has done a phenomenal job for the city. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Jim. And then I'm going to use others' voices to tell you even more. So Jim came from DC, arriving here in 1989. As you know, he's married to Kimberly and has two phenomenal children. We all know Jim. I don't think there's anyone in this room who hasn't had the opportunity to work with him or spend time with him in his position as general manager of the Gardens Mall, as his work as a, voluntary, um, as a volunteer with Board of Directors for Palm Beach Gardens Police and Fire Foundation, which he's been with for over a decade. He served in Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce, on the Board of Directors, Executive Trustee Member, North PAC, on and on and on. So I could sit here all night and read Jim's bio to you, but instead what we did was we asked the people who spend time with him to give us a few kind words. So I hope you're not too embarrassed about this. We'll start with one from your son, Will, who wrote, my father has been an amazing role model for me growing up. He has taught me what it means to be dependable, consistent, unconditionally supportive. No matter what stage my life was in, I always felt cared for, loved, and accepted by him. My father's steady presence in my life made me feel confidence I needed to take risks, succeeds, and most importantly, fail with grace. Thank you for being my family's rock and our North Star. I love you so much, Dad. Congratulations on your retirement and career. 
There's so much more, you guys. I'll, I'll read quickly. My, uh, this is from your daughter, Jessica. My dad is an incredibly bright, warm-hearted person. I know I can always count on him to be cracking jokes around the dinner table or laughing to himself, even when no one else understands. I thank, <laughs> I thank him for my sense of humor and being a constant grounding force that has never left my side, even in the quiet moments when nothing more is said than the proud look in his eyes. I know that I'll always be loved and cared for, no matter where life takes me. Thank you, Dad, for working so hard to make sure that our family always feels secure. Congratulations on the next chapter on your life. And she said she loves you very much. Now, there are some people here tonight that um, are proud to be here but still gave uh, some nice words. And there will be some people on this list who couldn't make it. So we'll start with um, Jack Schnurr, your director of security from the Gardens Mall, who wrote, working under Jim's direction for almost six years was a great experience that few other security directors ever get to experience. His leadership and dedication to staff, retailers, and the community lent itself to a testimony to his focus all the while while raising a family. Quite a number of impressive accomplishments on so many levels in a variety of areas. David Gregg, your former director of security, also said that he was an original um, employee with you and was hired just four months after the grand opening that you were, excuse me, hired just four months after the grand opening, and there couldn't have been a better position for you. It was no surprise that you were promoted to general manager as soon as the opportunity arose, that you are the ultimate professional, that you serve customers, employees, and the community at large, and you've done so impeccably for 33 years. Well done. From Brian Hill, I have had the privilege of working with Jim McCartan for over 25 years. Jim was a great mentor to me and always there to help me when I needed. Reg Miller says, Jim McCartan has been an invaluable director for the MacArthur Center Property Owners Association. His community knowledge, sensitivity to issues, and candor are second to none and will be missed. Just a couple more. From Donna Carrington, who said she's so, so sorry she can't be here tonight. Jim, congratulations on your amazing 33-year career with the Garden Small. I had the pleasure of working with Jim for the last nine years. Incredible mentor, sincere, kind, caring, and anyone lucky enough to work for him was blessed. He has truly made a difference in so many lives. His hard work and dedication to the many committees that he sat on to help build Palm Beach Gardens and the Gardens Mall into what we see today. Jim is truly an amazing person. Happy retirement. Never forget the positive difference you made in so many people's lives, including mine. Enjoy every day. I hope you enjoy every minute that you truly reserve, deserve in this recognition. Cheers to 33 years. Dana Middleton from the PGA Corridor Association states, Jim has always been a wonderful leader and an integral part of our community not only during his role and tenure at the Gardens Mall, but as a resident of Palm Beach Gardens and the community. I personally really look up to him. And then from Irwin, on behalf of the whole board, the president of the board of directors of the Palm Beach Gardens Police and Fire Foundation congratulates Mr. Jim McCartan on the occasion of his retirement from a successful and meaningful career at the Gardens Mall. Further, the board thanks him for his past and continuing service to Palm Beach Gardens first responders though, through his work as a board member and officer of the foundation. And last but not least, from your beautiful wife, Kimberly. The Gardens Mall and Palm Beach Gardens will always hold such a special place for us. Jim and I met while working at the mall office together in 1999, married and raised two amazing children here. Throughout the years, anyone that knew me would make a point to tell me how much they loved the mall, state that it always looked as good as the day that it opened, and grateful that they always felt safe there. Ending perfectly with, your husband does such an incredible job. And they are absolutely right. He not only knows every inch of the, excuse me, he not only knows every inch of the shopping center, he knows the people, is consistent and dependable, and always wanted what was best for the community, joining committees and boards, representing the chamber, being a part of our favorite events. events. Jim always said yes. Not because it was part of the job, because he genuinely cared. His dry wit will catch you off guard, and it's that moment you realize how brilliantly his mind works, especially when it comes to how things work, understanding their simplicity, and appreciating their complexities. He's a true master of anticipating the absolute worst, which is great at work and on the logistics committee, but not as fun at home, LOL. As a family, we are so incredibly proud of Jim, his steadfast commitment to all things, but especially to us. We are grateful and so happy for this new chapter, for him to relax, to explore if he wants to and perhaps say no and simply enjoy all that he earned and deserves from his years of unwavering dedication. So on behalf of our council, we would like to uh, thank you for your time and we're gonna come down and take a picture now, if that would be all right.
real camp. All right, everybody's still comfortable? Yeah, thank you so much for your patience. Next, we have the agreement allowing pedestrian crossing rapid flashing beacon signs. Will Todd Engel, hello. City engineer, please come to the podium, thank you. Good evening, Council. Todd Engel, city engineer, and we're here to present a grant that we received a couple years ago. We've been going through the process in the grant and now it's time to bid the project. So before you tonight is the actual bid documents that we need to approve for the FDOT, and it consists of uh, 10 pedestrian flashers that will be installed within the core of our city. Basically, it'll create a safe route to school. It'll serve as Palm Beach Gardens High School, Bright Futures, Palm Beach Gardens Elementary, and Hal Watkins. As you know, there's several uh, flashers in crosswalks down uh, MacArthur Boulevard, and we look to install nine more within the core of the city, again, servicing those schools. These will be solar-powered flashers uh, with crosswalks. They'll all be mid-block crossings, and they'll have our signature uh, stamp concrete that'll go in those. Then also we have another one that will be installed on Gardenia and Holly Drive, the main entrance into Palm Beach Gardens High School, and that will be a fully lit pavement as well as a solar-powered pedestrian flasher. This total construction of this project is 550,000. The TPA grant funding portion will be 335,000. We'll be bidding this project in February and we'll be awarding it in the summer and the project will be complete by the time the school starts for the fall 2021-23 season. Any questions? So to, just to repeat, so it won't be happening while the kids are in school? You're just no, saying. we will have it done over the summer. When they return to school, they'll have all those flashes. That is so great. Thank you so much. And I know you've been working on this for years. Yes. Years and years. <laughs> these grant process work, and we have more in the, in the pipeline, so you'll be seeing more of these grants coming back in front of you. Thank you. Council, do you have any questions or comments? No, I just want to say thank you so much. I mean, f I, no money is free, but you worked so hard for this and uh, to have the grant is amazing. So it's going to excellent use and it's in the perfect spots too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. All right. So next is comments from public on items not on the agenda. I have a few public comment cards that I believe are in reference to something we'll be discussing shortly. So I'm going to be hanging on to those, and I will see if our city manager has a report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and members of the council, I bring a, an issue uh, to you this evening. Uh, I apologize up front for the length of this presentation, but I think it's uh, well worth uh, the time to spend to understand what's being proposed here by Palm Beach County. Uh, First off, I'd like to go to uh, hurricane efforts, as the mayor mentioned. Um, as far as our efforts at uh, Hurricane Ian, 
volunteer efforts, as, as you mentioned, uh, the past few weeks, uh, the recovery effort uh, has been ongoing with our volunteers. The fire rescue department mobilized a strike team, as they always do uh, with our state emergency response plan. They've actually treated 523 patients, including a successful resuscitation uh, of a cardiac arrest victim. Um, also, the fire chaplain has been deployed there as well uh, to support our team. And uh, they will be returning on uh, Tuesday, October the 11th. Uh, Palm Beach Gardens Police Department sent two uh, NORTHCOM dispatchers uh, October 1 to provide assistance in Collier County. Uh, they were redirected again to uh, Henry County. Uh, and we're in the queue. Uh, waiting for uh, directions to deploy a team of 10 police officers, then we're expect, expecting that to be uh, notified soon. Uh, they're doing a rotation basis. Also, our emergency uh, management uh, director, David Reyes, recently uh, provided uh, training for American Public Works Association leaders for our sister cities program when we assisted Callaway up in after Hurricane Michael, uh, and uh, they have used that as their model for all of the other cities uh, in the American Public Works Association's uh, attempt to get other cities to do similar things here over in, in, in uh, the Fort Myers area. So uh, we will be adding our name to the list of cities that will adopt other cities and helping them with their employees to recover so those employees can help the residents recover like we did in Callaway. So we look forward to doing that. Another item I bring to your attention, uh, we have uh, sent you information and it was in the newspaper about the Jupiter Medical Center partnership with the University of Florida, uh, putting up a neighborhood or a mini hospital at Avenir. Also in that article, uh, Jupiter Medical Center and the University of Florida mentioned their plans to build some type of research hospital in the Brigger Scripps site. Uh, more information is forthcoming uh, for all of us. Uh, we've invited uh, Dr. Hamid Rastogi and from the Jupiter Medical Center and uh, Dr. Nelson from the University of Florida to our November uh, meeting, that's November 3. Uh, to provide the council with their vision of what the 90 acres uh, overall in Alton at the Brigger site uh, might be. So we look forward to hearing from them uh, in the November meeting. So those are the miscellaneous items to bring to your attention. Uh, the most pressing item, of course, would be uh, the uh, widening of uh, North Lake proposal uh, initiated by Palm Beach County. Uh, first off, um, I had uh, worked with Sal Faso from the NCNC who helped me set up uh, a meeting. Actually, I had stayed out of his way and he set up the meeting with David Ricks, the county engineer. Uh, the purpose of the meeting was to get uh, the mayor and staff, members of the NCNC, uh, and our community together to hear from the county engineer as to what the study is about and what they hope to accomplish with the study and why. Um, the meeting was set up. It was confirmed uh, for this past Wednesday. Um, I got a phone call from, the, from David Ricks who said he was uh, advised from higher-ups at the administration level he is not to meet with the city of Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, which is quite a setback uh, when you think about the professionalism of administration and county and city levels. Uh, the most important thing that they have to do is to communicate with their citizens. And here we are, the most impactful of anyone and our neighbors from West Palm and, and even in the unincorporated areas that would have the most impact of what they're proposing and them refusing to meet with us and explain what those impacts are. 
The other purpose of that meeting was frankly a professional one to let uh, the engineer know that we have a presentation, we have an issue that we would be bringing before the council uh, the next day, which is tonight, uh, as a professional courtesy. And we wanted to understand where they were coming from so that when we did our presentation, we would at least know what their intentions were long term. Well, unfortunately, that didn't occur. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to tell you that they refused to meet with us. So we're going to move on with what we do know. The purpose here tonight of this presentation, and number one, is to uh, talk about the widening of North Lake into eight lanes. And there's a presentation we have later that will give you all the details as far as the parameters are concerned. But if you'll recall, the council adopted Resolution 64 2021 on 7 October 21, opposing the countywide comp the county's comp plan amendment to widen North uh, Lake Boulevard to eight lanes. Here tonight, we're asking your approval to uh, uh, of Resolution 71, which is opposing again, the county's expenditure of up to $400,000 to commission a feasibility study for the taking of right of way to implement their comprehensive plan amendment. That would be Resolution 71, which explains that. We're also asking for the council to authorize the mayor to sign a letter to go along with Resolution 21 uh, to the county engineer because he requested that we respond to him by October 14th uh, to David Ricks. He, he sent that letter on the 20th of September of opposing the waste of taxpayers' dollars uh, to fund this study. Uh, and I think the presentation that we have, well, at least it made it very clear to us uh, that this would be a near impossible mission should they choose to undertake it. <clears throat> so in addition, I think that it would be uh, a st strategic idea to, at this point, involve the public in one of two ways. We have been told by David Ricks uh, that the letting of the contract for this study would be sometime in November or December. Uh, he says he would notify us. In the event that we get plenty of time, uh, notification and plenty of time, uh, we would like for the council to consider, uh, if we have time, a uh, special meeting to invite all the residents from the city from the county, from West Palm Beach, all of the impacted areas to come. And we would prepare a presentation uh, illustrating what would happen to each piece of property along North Lake all the way out to Bay Hill and our golf course all the way to Military Trail, which you will see tonight. Uh, in the event that we don't have enough notice from the county to do this, then we would go as much as we could to notify the NCNC who could help us get the word out to residents of West Palm Beach, uh, the county, as well as the gardens uh, to uh, let, let, the, let everyone know about when this is on the BOCC agenda so that they could go if they chose and express their opinion. Um, so we have various ways electronically and everything to be able to notify people. We would do the best we could with that. So that would be the plan uh, in addition to the authorization of the letter and the approval of Resolution 71. I apologize for getting those two things out to you late today. Trust me, it wasn't, it wasn't easy and that was the best we could do with the resources we had at hand. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce to you Todd Engel, our city engineer, and Ross. Where's Ross? You're here with Gilman. Uh, 
to uh, our GIS director uh, to uh, give you a presentation that will give you a strong indication of what we're talking about here. Ross Gilmore, you're up first. Thank you. Good evening. Todd and I put together a quick study to try to show the impacts <clears throat> of the thoroughfare right-of-way identification map for the county. The county has broken the North Lake Boulevard. Can into you speak closer to, get the closer, closer to the mic? I have to. <laughs> so the county's broken North Lake Boulevard into two sections, what they call the East Tim, which extends from Military Trail west to the Beeline Highway, and the West Tim, which is from State Road 7 out to the entrance of Bay Hill. What we've been provided is this typical of what's being proposed. Uh, they're proposing roughly going from a 120 foot typical right of way to a 142 foot wide right of way with a 20 foot wide medium and an estimated cost of expansion at 15.9 million. I want to note that North Lake Boulevard is a variable width right of way. Some parts of North Lake goes from roughly 107 to 108 feet in width up to 150 feet. But what their typical cross section shows is the eight lane only without turn lanes. So to add turn lanes in, it'd have to be even wider than the 142. Again, the east area is from Military Trail out to the B line as shown on this map. On these next maps, each map represents about 1,500 linear feet along North Lake. We set it as scales so you could easily see uh, the impacts to some of the businesses, residential areas. The light green areas actually represent areas that are in the county area. They're unincorporated areas. The non-shaded areas are actually in Palm Beach Gardens jurisdiction. The light or the red line that we show is what's being proposed that we know for the taking. 22 feet, it would be roughly 11 feet from each right away. And the purple line is additional 11 feet for everything that exists in this uh, green area, the belted area now, to be relocated. What's in there are in-ground utilities, above-ground utilities, landscape buffers, privacy walls, and a whole host of things. So it has to be relocated, and we'll show that. This slide is street-level imagery Starting here is a Chevron station at the northwest corner of Military and North Lake. Uh, you can see all the utility poles, the signalization uh, support pole, the in-ground utilities, and all the landscaping that would be impacted. The Roughly the right-of-way taking would be just behind these poles. But again, all that would have to be relocated and thereby could impact the landscaping, parking, and everything. Same for the south right-of-way line, which shows here is the shell station. And again, the signalization would have to be relocated. This is a good picture to show all the above ground utilities uh, and light poles you can see extending down North Lake. Here is on the north right-of-way line and one of the homes that's in an unincorporated area that would be impacted. The right-of-way line would be back to the fence. The utilities would have to be relocated and the fence and you'd be right out there back of house. 
Same for this office center on the uh, south side, uh, how close it would be to their parking and impact the landscaping they have. So the next section we're showing is mainly within the county uh, jurisdiction, the unincorporated areas. But you can see here at East Highland Pines Boulevard, the uh, proposed taking would be right on top of a garage associated with this duplex unit. And then this is a triplex that the line would be on with the relocation of everything shown in purple. And then the South Railway line, and out here is our Hidden Hollow neighborhood. So again, this is a house with the uh, garage. Todd has some exhibits to show how everything would be relocated. Here in a little bit, he'll show you. Here's the triplex, how close that would bring to the triplex. And then here is an entry to Hidden Hollow. You can see the entry gate and increasing the right of way here would shorten the stacking distance uh, and they're already below code and Todd has an exhibit for that. So moving a little further west, you can see our 911 Memorial where the taking would be by the red line and then all the utilities relocated behind the red line right in front of the Memorial. On the south side, you see Hidden Hollow west of their entrance, and you can see several of the uh, homes here and how close they are. This house comes right up to the red line. This one has a lanai, and there's a wall with landscaping outside. If the wall had to be relocated, it would impact these tremendously. Moving a little further west is uh, the Horseshoe Acres sub-neighborhood with the uh, wall you can see as a white line, the top of the wall, and where the taking would be associated with that wall. Pictures here are the memorial with the existing situation. By the time they do the taking and move the utilities back, we're right there on the memorial and Hidden Hollow. Here are the homes. This is a home with the lanai. You can see once that's widened, we'd be back to the wall and possibly have to relocate that wall into their backyards. So the next slide, this is at Christ Fellowship. This is one of the wider sections of North Lake Boulevard. It's 150 feet in width. Uh, they do have some room here where they could remove the mandarin a sidewalk and push it back and uh, pick up some land there. Here is Cypress Hollow. You can see on that dashed line, the white line beneath it is their uh, wall feature. And then down here we start steeplechase. So again, pictures showing the existing conditions, the signalization, all the utilities. A little further west, again, is Steeplechase. Uh, the wall, again, they have the lush landscape in a berm. Pictures of that. And Steeplechase also has the guardhouse that their stacking distance would be shortened as well. And you can note the berm with all the landscaping and the wall on top of the berm and the utilities. So here would be the impacts around the turnpike. This is a PGA National Commerce Center, Chatworth ALF, and the impact there to their drive aisle and parking, and then Gables and their landscaping, and the city's park here at PGA. This is a view of Chatworth, the ALF, and how it would be impacted, and some of the other features. So when we get out to PGA National, you'll see the white line right here represents the top of the wall. The red line in places is behind the wall. Other places, it's directly on top of the wall. 
but the purple line is right back on top of the residential lots. Some may think that it'd be easier or worth looking at pushing the right away south, but this area is protected as preserved, and on further west is West Palm Beach. Pictures here showing the existing conditions and the PGA National Wall and all the utilities. Again, the wall location, the white line, and the impact on all these residential units. The light blue shading is actually West Palm jurisdiction. Then we're out to the B-Line Highway. Uh, the plan is to eight lane it to B-Line and not widen it past the B-Line until you get to State Road 7. So there'll be a choke point there. The west affected area again is from State Road 7 out to Bay Hill entrance. Again, West Palm jurisdiction, the Ibis uh, shopping plaza impacts to it with uh, the parking right against the road. And then some of the communities we have Pictures of that and Ibis's lush landscaping. And then on out is our C golf course and impacts to it and impacts to Bay Hill and their water management area. Again, pictures of our golf course and our uh, monument sign and then Bay Hill. The wall here at Bay Hill would have to be removed by the time you did the taking of right away and push back there and pack their water management area. So with that, Todd. Good evening. So what the county proposed in their Tim was they just drew a straight line. It's 120 feet here and 120 feet here. We're going to 142. As you saw when, when Ross went down the road, some of those right away squeezed in and out and they get a little wider with turn lanes. So the actual affected area becomes either more or less in those areas. So we have right away widths of between 107 and about 150 in there. So some areas will be affected a little less, some areas will be affected a little more, but we look specifically at some of the actual homes and some of the uh, communities in there and how they would be affected. And to bring a few bullet points of actually how they would be affected is, is taking of private property would be the first big one. There would be a lot of private property taken up and down the corridor of North Lake Boulevard. Now, when you drive down North Lake Boulevard, you know you're in the city of Palm Beach Gardens because it looks like Palm Beach Gardens. It's buffered like Palm Beach Gardens. There's beautiful entry features like Palm Beach Gardens in that this threatens to take that away to make it more look like what Okeechobee would be where we have very little landscaping walls and residential homes just behind there or commercial properties just behind there. So the reduction of landscape buffers becomes a big concern along with non-conformities. We've approved most of these communities to have the buffers, to have the walls, to have everything they included to make them a part of Palm Beach Gardens, and this does threaten to take that away. Uh, some walls will be moved, possibly gone. Uh, utility relocates, street lights, power poles, and all those will come closer to the homes, as well as all the noise itself will come closer to the homes. Um, again, we, we touched on the nonconformities in a possible removal of affordable housing because there are a couple multi-units in there that are affordable housing that, that may be removed altogether. And so here is, is the Highland Pines area. This is actually an unincorporated. Just looking at what they'll need in this particular area is the 11 feet, 11 feet back to this yellow line. And what's not accounted for in their overall cross section is the utilities. They, they put a sidewalk with one foot to bring it back up and down to the existing grades, but those utilities that exist up and down the road, both above ground and underground, need to be relocated. So you can see how even if we add a few more feet for easements back in there, that those homes will most likely be taken. Uh, we touched on Hidden Hollow again. They currently have a 175-foot stacking distance. That will be reduced to 64. Our code requires 100 from the right-of-way line. So that will become another nonconformity. Staying with Hidden Hollow, currently 
Right at the right-of-way line exists a 10-foot buffer that they own, they maintain, they have a wall in the middle of that. That's shown here, and they have a nine-foot setback to their actual homes where they can put in patios, whatever else they'd like. What is being proposed in this section would leave a one-foot buffer in that area in which maybe the wall can go back in, maybe it can't because the foundation can't go in the right-of-way, so now the foundation would have to go on the private property. So taking a look at that again, here's what you see what they have. That would be completely gone. These trees would be gone. That wall, if they can get it in, would go within that one foot buffer and then it would go nine foot to the property line. And if they use those setbacks to put in any improvements within those setbacks, those most likely would be gone as well. Looking at steeplechase, steeplechase is approved with an overall 25 foot buffer. There's 14 foot and then the landscape wall and then another 10 feet beyond that for the residential homes. As you can see, we only allow a six foot high residential wall. So they burn that wall up to create a higher a wall height and they're able to establish a lot of landscaping within that landscape buffer. We do not know what is going to become of that landscape buffer, how the wall will be either moved, relocated or resupported through a retaining wall system. But we do know that the landscape will be gone. Underground utilities that exist have to be relocated and all the above grounds have to be relocated. And this is the underground network that just Seacoast has alone within that system. That doesn't include all the telecommunication lines that have been bored over the years in these areas. So, you know, still looking at that with the four foot landscape buffer in the wall, those utilities have to go somewhere. And they're either gonna go closer to the residential lots or they're gonna go on an easement located outside of that road right away. So we, we just don't know how that'll end up looking. Uh, looking back at PGA National, as Ross discussed, these areas over here are environmentally sensitive lands. We know that the, when the FDOT came in to do the intersection improvements at Beeline and North Lake Boulevard, they proposed a, a free right coming off Beeline onto eastbound uh, North Lake Boulevard. They could not get that land from West Palm Beach. So what we're stuck with today is a, basically a U-turn where now if you wanna go eastbound North Lake Boulevard, you have gotta go west make a U-turn and come back east because they could not take those lands. So if the county is faced with that same dilemma, it currently exists about 126 to 128 feet. That would have to come from the PGA side if they couldn't get the environmental lands. So what you see is they have a very similar situation in, in, uh, in steeplechase. So they have the elevated berm, they have beautiful landscaping, and they have high tension lines and street lights that run down the street there. Looking at them, they're again approved with a 25 foot buffer. It's about a 15 foot setback to that wall. If they take that 11, and I've got a couple different scenarios of what would happen, everything would come closer to the road. The wall would have to move back and they would have to create some sort of landscape buffer. And that would all be within a private property line that would come either to the property line or go within the property line. A use of a retaining wall may be able to save some of that property on that side very expensive to run that whole line with, with a retaining wall system and so they can keep their backyards or they can just take the private property altogether and move the wall entirely back. So these are things that we don't know, but we know the impact will definitely be to the community and the impact will be to what we've created over the last 40 years of North Lake Boulevard and how it looks today because it is gardens. Uh, just a quick look out west. Um, this is our golf course property. This is Bay Hill Estates. They only have 112, they need a 142. So this is a larger taking for them. And then also the existing turn lane would have to go back. That turn lane would, would wipe out our monument sign. Um, I don't know how they're gonna transition. This is a transition point from three lanes to, to, to four lanes in this area. So those transitions have to be put somewhere. Are they in a form of a turn lane? Are they re gonna require more taking? But at a minimum, they would take a lot of the entry feature of Bay Hill Estates and they would take their current retaining wall and move their surface water management system back. Again, that would be a non-conformity for, for Bay Hill Estates in that area. And that concludes our presentation. If there's any questions that you have, we'd be happy to answer. Thank you both so much. Ross, great work with the mapping. It was eye-opening. And Todd, thank you for explaining it uh, piece by piece. I'm going to, uh, if you, everyone would indulge me, I'm going to ask, we've had some people who put some comment cards in. Uh, we're, we're not done. Not done, there's more. <laughs> we're not done. <laughs> All right, bring it on. What have we got? Wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. Okay, uh, I apologize. Thank you. Todd and Ross uh, spent a good part of uh, their week last week and this week 
uh, putting this together, it did not cost $400,000. <laughs> well done. All right. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, what we have here is what the county's five-year road program mid-year adjustments they're asking for. You'll see uh, one up from the bottom, $400,000 budgeted for this uh, study that the county wants to do. Fortunately, we were able to obtain some video of a couple of meeting, a couple of meetings regarding the at the TPA uh, of uh, the county engineer trying to explain what the study was about. And fortunately, one of the key players here happens to be, uh, I guess, the vice chair of the TPA, uh, our mayor. And we we would like for you to hear what the uh, county engineer has to say and how well uh, our vice, uh, I mean, the vice chairman, but our mayor uh, was able to grill, I mean, pull up information from uh, the engineer. If you would play the tape, I won't please. go into detail, but we have projects in East District. Uh, wow. But on this one, two key ones, the Donald Ross Road, Basco Bridge, equipment, $8 million. We've got programs for this fiscal year. And then on North Lake, we're going to do a study to look at the impact of potentially if, there, if we look at uh, eight landing North Lake. And so this will be a study to look at the potential impact of uh, North Lake. Not so we're going to do the project, but this would be a more of a comprehensive planning uh, process. Than like seeing it firsthand. So you mentioned briefly a study that the county um, is working on regarding eight-laning North Lake Boulevard. Can you tell me how much that was going to well, cost? Well, we're still working through the getting actually a final cost from the uh, the consultant, and so we're we have not still going back and forth in terms of that, that number. And once we get a number that we thought was reasonable, we'll present that to the board probably in November, December for consideration to approve the contract. And once the contract gets approved, then it's a 12-year process uh, to uh, get that to get that to get that study done. And so we'll definitely you evolve had, you all, had a the, all up. You, had a num you did have a number up. It was like 400,000 or yeah, that's that's a planning number, but we want to get something lower than that. And so, but uh, we're talking about a half a million uh, dollars of taxpayer money to consider the possibility of adding extra lanes, which we know don't work to move people. It does nothing but add more cars to the road on an area that goes through five different jurisdictions as well as natural space. So why is it possibly worth spending half a million dollars on a project that you even said you're not going to do when you presented it a moment ago? You said we're most likely not going to do it. I just said that it's up to the board for consideration. And so my, the board uh, directed me, I presented in June that we will start, uh, we'll take a look at this planning document uh, and present that to the board. And so I'm in the process of, of getting a contract to present to the board. It's up to the board to make a final decision. Right. It's a planning document that could cost a half a million dollars. And you're saying it's a 190% increase in prices for most of your supplies currently going forward. Um, and we talk about safe streets and, and what the TPA has been trying to do. And we know that adding lanes and adding roadway capacity just puts more cars on the road. It doesn't necessarily fix the issue. So I just don't understand why we're taking time and money to look at something that's probably not feasible. And now you're telling us is 12 years away. I'll be up for the board to make a final determination. I'm, I understand. Well, okay, great. Just so obviously the city uh, is not in great support of that. We even passed a resolution against it. Thank you. I understand. Thanks. So, um, <laughs> good job. So we wanted to put uh, information here as to who, whom to contact. Uh, and uh, we, this is part of the presentation. It will be uh, on our website. Uh, available to any anybody and everyone who wants to uh, communicate with the administration and the county engineer about uh, this study. It's my understanding that the county commission, uh, minus some commissioners voting against it, which Maria Marino did, 
uh, directed staff to proceed with uh, hiring a consulting and bringing it back to the BOCC so that they could approve a consultant to do the study. Our own Maria Marino, commissioner from District 1, voted against that. Uh, thank you. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, that basically concludes my presentation for the night. Thank you so much. Uh, so if you guys could indulge a little further, we do have some comment cards. It's really important that the voices of those who could be affected by this have the opportunity to speak. So when I call your name, if you could please come to the podium, state your name and your address. We'll start with Mr. Sal Faso. Can you hear me okay? Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And I know you know me, and I know all of you up there very well, but there may be people behind me that don't know who I am. But I'm the president of something called the North County Neighborhood Coalition. We have almost 50,000 people in the coalition, 33,000 voters. We have 23 communities. Many of them are going to be represented here tonight. Most of them are in Palm Beach Gardens, and they all are along North Lake Boulevard. We had a meeting on June 27th with the county where they reveal this plan to us in more detail, and we objected then as a formal organization, the North County Neighborhood Coalition. So behind me, and I'm authorized to speak, by the way, for West Palm Beach. I've spoken to the mayor. He's given me the authority to express its objection to the study as well. I have a letter to that effect in my folder. Uh, we have uh, Rustic Lakes has authorized me to speak. Bay Hill has authorized me to speak. Rosa this morning from Avenir has authorized me to speak. We have representation from Carlton Oaks, Osprey, PGA, Ballon Isle, Steeplechase. Uh, uh, Bob Yeager could not be here from Montecito, but all the communities along, and Ibis obviously, along North Lake Boulevard. And I agree with Todd, all the issues that he had presented with respect to the concerns we have, but I would add one more to it. It's not in the character of this area to have an eight lane highway in the middle of these prominent residential communities. And think about the demographics of some of the residents that exist there. They're at an age level where, you know, they get used to routine. And you put something else out there, for example, remove their turn lanes, whether it's in or out of the communities. We have Publix as a shopping center, in or out. Those are safety conditions. And all of you, obviously, as elected officials, have your number one priority, public safety. And we believe this is going to be jeopardizing public safety. So we are in full support as a coalition of Palm Beach Gardens and of West Palm Beach opposing the study. We think the money could be used more wisely. This morning I was with uh, Madam Mayor. I said we ought to send this money out to uh, uh, Fort Myers and their hurricane uh, you know, relief fund rather than using this on a, on a study that maybe is 12 years out from today. I, I, as a former businessman, I was just talking to Brian. I wouldn't be doing that if I were them. It doesn't make sense from a business point of view. So we thank you very much for your support. We've done our diligence as a community, for example, in Ibis alone, we would stand to lose our park, uh, two homes for sure, based upon, and we've gone to the county appraiser's office and we've done our diligence with our maps and we see that. So we've got strong ob objection from Ibis as well, even though we're in West Palm Beach, but we're brothers and sisters right next to everybody within uh, uh, Palm Beach Gardens. So if there's anything you need from any of us, just give me a call, Ron, you know, or Madam Mayor, and. We're prepared to help in any way we possibly can. But we do support 100% what Palm Beach Gardens is trying to suggest to the county. It is not wise to spend this money, and it's kind of a foolish endeavor to begin with because it's never going to happen the way they're, they're perceiving this. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Mr. Faso, um, Marcy noticed that you didn't say your address, please, if you'd be so I'm kind. sorry, say again? Uh, your address. Oh, well. I'm sorry, 7741 Blue Heron Way, West Palm Beach, 33412. Thank you so much. Next, I would like to call Victor Martin. If you could state your name and address, please. Thank you. Victor Martin of 8896 Oldham Way, Palm Beach Gardens, 33412. I'm the president of the HOA for Carlton Oaks. I'm also on the board of directors for the NCNC. And I want to offer my thanks and total support in, in, in this endeavor to stop the uh, eight lanes. Uh, one thing that I'd like to bring up that was maybe known but not mentioned is that that Shell gas station, uh, from what I've seen of your presentation, they've got fuel tanks in the ground. And from what I see, I'm not an engineer, 
going to obviously default to that, but that's a thought that I not, did not hear a thought of. <clears throat> I've spoken to the Shell gas station people. I've spoken to the public's uh, uh, grocery store there and uh, asked them if I need to get corporate, and the manager said, you're looking at them. So if we need anything from them, he says, let me know. I'll write a letter. And uh, also, um, what I'd like to support was mentioned about the safety. Um, you folks all know your own roads, your homes, your driveways. What I'd like to offer for a safety aspect of what we go through, and especially Osprey, we happen to have an uh, egress lane into Carlton Oaks. We have the lose that within eight lanes. Now think of yourself going down North Lake traffic 55, 65 miles an hour. You got people on your bumper. Even if you turn your signal on, wanting to turn into your home, they're on you. And so now you've got to, what do you do? Slam on the brakes, make a hard turn. You've got your kid in the back seat and a child care. It's a big safety factor. Besides all the numbers that you can already think of, there's a lot of numbers of this, cost and expense. It, it seems like it's totally ridiculous to even think about doing it. But the point that I want to bring up is the safety aspect, and that's what we would live with every day of our lives. So think about you going home, pulling into your driveway every night after a long day of work, you're tired, and you wonder if you're going to get rear-ended, or the guy's blown his horn, and what do you have to do to make a turn? That's why we need to keep it down to six lanes. It's a minor factor in a way we can keep our egress and, and also accelerations out of our communities. And that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'd like to call James Krause, please. If you could state your name and address. Thank you so much. Jim Krause, 1040 Diamond Headway. Um, so it already sounds like I'm preaching to the choir um, uh, in terms of the reaction I'm getting. Um, but. Um, PGA um, is um, sort of uniquely situated. And as you can, I hadn't really seen that map. Um, Excuse me, sir. Could you please speak closer to the microphone? Yeah, sure. Thank um, you. I hadn't seen that um, map showing the encroachments on the property lines until this evening. Um, as Sal had mentioned, we had met with the um, engineers, but they didn't get into that. But you can see the enormous um, impact on PGA National. We have a lot of homes uh, right along that area. Um, and they would all be, have to be sort of be moved back or the property lines would have to be moved back, um, which is a um, you know, real concern of ours. Also, the monuments, it looks like they would have to be pushed back into what is now private property. So that isn't going to work. Um, there's one other thing that um, PGA National is concerned about, and that is the um, use of Ryder Cup Boulevard. Um, we're concerned that if this project goes through, that Ryder Cup Boulevard is going to get additional traffic. And that is a great concern to us. So, um, and as it stands right now, we're getting enough traffic on, on Ryder Cup, but um, if the traffic is forced through there, it's gonna be a real problem for us. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'll be calling Matthew Kimula, please. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that properly. Madam Mayor. Fellow council members, Matthew Camula, 9678 Osprey Isles Boulevard, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, 33412. Very proud to say that. I stand here before all of you uh, after being eight years the president of Osprey Isles HOA. Seven years started uh, since the starting of our process to incorporate into or get in, uh, annexed into the city of Palm Beach Gardens. And a few shorter years starting to talk about our right-hand turn lane. You can imagine my surprise here. The burning question in your mind is, when is Camula gonna come before us and talk about something other than the Osprey Isles right-hand turn lane? Hopefully that day is coming soon. Uh, you can also imagine my surprise that we didn't have a turn lane, I'm sorry, we don't have a turn lane, we engaged the city to help us get a right-hand turn lane. We brokered a, uh, a, a reasonable way to get the right-hand turn lane, and now the county comes in with this study that may want to take away our right-hand turn lane, which isn't yet there, which is still in the ether. So on behalf of Osprey Isles, 
we are opposed to North Lake going to eight lanes. Our residents did not buy into the uh, Southern Boulevard, Okeechobee Boulevard concept uh, way of life. We bought into Palm Beach Gardens. We bought into the gardens. We bought into the green, the nice frontages, uh, and what you have through Palm Beach, uh, you know, PGA. That's what we looked for. That's what we spent our money, and that's what we would like to maintain. Uh, going to eight lanes, that's going to put more than a monkey wrench. And uh, you can see through the very quickly put together study, Todd, that was, that's amazing for very quickly put together. Um, the gyrations that you're going to have to go through in order for taking the right of way and the amount of money to be spent uh, doesn't justify what uh, uh, the county is proposing. For us, it's a very personal thing to maintain our right-hand turn lane and get it in place. It's almost like a shell game. Here it is, there it's not. And uh, we would certainly like to have it because quite honestly, Carlton Oaks has a turn lane, the uh, golf course has a turn lane, Ibis has a turn lane, Avenir has a turn lane, the cemetery has a turn lane. So we provide turn lanes for dead people, but Osprey is the bastard child that is, remains out there that doesn't have a right-hand turn lane. So Osprey opposed to eight lanes, in favor of six lanes, and that's my story and I'm sticking with it. Thank you. Thank you for that sound bite. I know we'll hear that one again. All right, next we'd like to please call uh, Ramona Bean. If you could come up, state your name and address, please. Good evening, Ramona Bean, uh, 5439 Cicada Way. Uh, I'm actually in Horseshoe Acres. Um, so, and funny enough, as I was listening to the presentation, thank you for putting it together. I was texting some of my resident friends and one of the neighbors who's actually on that um, line there, his, we call him Monsieur Charles. He's a, he's a French coach and he's got a, a beautiful daughter and a pro wife. So anyway, um, this is gonna affect folks. So thank you for uh, bringing this to our attention. And I can, uh, I can already speak for a lot of people in Horseshoe Acres. We're happy to support it. Um, I've been also having the opportunity to learn on the TPA as a, a member of the Citizens Advisory Committee for District 1. Um, thank you, Commissioner Marino, again for letting me have that opportunity. And I agree with what our mayor said. I'm so glad to hear her say it um, you know, publicly that the big lanes, I used to live off by um, Southern when I was a child and, and seeing what it's become expanded, I just don't think that's the purpose of Palm Beach Gardens and I'm, I feel so blessed to live in this city now. Um, and it is because it always was more green. Um, and I pull out all, every day with my kids um, on North Lake and I always have to look not just for the cars, but for pedestrians, people with their strollers, people on their bikes. You know, It's a very um, frequented area with people on foot, so I'm concerned, of course. So if you, if you um, and the city do need us to come out and, and be more vocal, just let us know. We're happy to help. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. We have one last card, and it is uh, County Commissioner for District 1, Maria Marino, please. Good evening all, County Commissioner Maria Marino. My address is 3 Carrick Road, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. And yes, I am uh, in support of everything you all are planning to do here. I would add several names to your contact info. I would add all the rest of the county commissioners to let them know what your voice is. I am very much in support of that. I would even send them the presentation. Um, I would do the best that I can at the commission level to sway the other county commissioners. When we have a meeting and it's open and it's public and it's in the sunshine, I can't do any of this otherwise. So that's why I encourage you to contact the other county commissioners. Um, I have from the beginning said this is a boondoggle. Yes, I just said that in public. Um, you know, there are the only two other four, uh, eight lane roadways that go east west in our county are Okeechobee and Southern, and those are state roads uh, with much less residential on them. So, the, not just the feasibility, but just the whole logic of it and safety of it is a, is a huge issue for me. And we want to keep gardens green. So, again, I would say add the rest of the county commissioners to that list. And I also maybe add the TPA to that list. And anything I can do from my office, you know I will. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Do, uh, would we like, I think my council is trying to say some things. Are you guys hoping to speak on this? Yes, Carl, would you mind starting? I'm just a traffic cop. <laughs> so it's a lot to absorb, you know. Um, if you look beyond the presentation and, and just the simple fact of taking land so they can eight lane it, you know, you kind of wonder how the county's going to afford it. Um, with the eminent domain, you know, I already spoke to Max a little bit, and maybe he can chime in on when they sue each piece of property. There's a lot of money on North Lake Boulevard. So then do you turn around and do a class action lawsuit against the county, which is going to cost half a billion in litigation? And then it becomes, uh, with Sal and his team, it becomes an election issue because this is going to go on beyond Maria. And it might even come into a council issue here to continue to support the opposition of eight laning. Um, and then getting the other commissioners involved with our reach around the county, it becomes an election issue for all of them. So it's a big picture, you know, and you know, you don't know if it's just. I mean, is it their goal to raise taxes somehow? Um, impact fees on contractors or building? You know, it's just, it just doesn't, this does, doesn't, the big picture of, of building this road, it just seems like it's beyond my grasp because it just doesn't look like it, it can possibly happen in any of our lifetime or even while Virginia is there. So you just wonder what the underlying thing is. So if Max has anything to say on it, I don't know. Or if it's time, if it's not time, it's fine. I mean, as far as the cost, I mean, it's it's purely speculative. But um, I mean, you can look up and down there. You don't have to be uh, an expert on eminent domain. I mean, you you've got probably anywhere from five hundred to a thousand different property owners, um, businesses, homes. Um, you're gonna the various HOAs are potentially gonna have standing beyond just their individual property owners. I would say conservatively, you're looking at somewhere between half a billion and a billion and a half to do the taking. Um, the I had said to each one of the council members uh, at one point during their agenda reviews that the style of the case, you know, Palm Beach County versus, will probably be 40 or 50 pages long because uh, they'll they'll do it in one eminent domain and name everyone. You'll have an untold number of attorneys on the defense side um there aren't any good yeah I, i'm like i'm sitting there thinking i'm going to go in a domain defense myself i'm going to run up and down the street with business cards um there are no good eminent domain attorneys that charge less than 500 dollars an hour i challenge you to find one the county would have to pay both sides of the uh, they pay the attorneys on both sides um the cost would be it, it's just staggering uh, the, the, to think about the cost of it. I mean, you're talking, like I said, 500 to one and a half billion. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. I mean, <laughs> it's a crazy amount of money uh, and, and the time. They would get the dirt relatively quickly, but the valuation hearings would last for years. And then you have massive severance damages. Some of the homes that they would probably try to make, to try to sever, they'd end up having to take totally because the, the value would basically be virtually, be virtually zero. You're going to have a sound wall right up against your back door. Um, it's impossible for all practical purposes. Anything's possible with enough money, but there's not enough money in the county to do this. All right, so I've been here since the, or in closing, I've been in, here since the early 80s, mid 80s. And uh, I know Okeechobee got widened, and I know Southern Boulevard got widened. And I still, in my mind, being here as, as long as I think those were unique to that area, and they may have been a little more rural or a little more commercial with a little more land than what we have on North Lake. So I think it's the county versus an army. So obviously the council is going to support it, and, and we'll be happily involved with whatever it takes to rattle the county's cage as long as we're here. So thank you. Thank you, Carl. Mark? Uh, this is the kind of stuff that drives people nuts. It's silliness. It doesn't have any merit. Um, there's no possible chance it's even going to get off the ground 
We're wasting people's time. We're wasting people's money. We have better ways to try to come up with solutions and moving people from the west to the east. So please forward um, all of the commissioners, uh, email addresses, and the TPA, and anybody else we can. Everyone in this council will send a note um, just requesting that they use their money and their time in a better and more effective way. Thank you. Rochelle? Well, again, I wanted to thank Ross and, and Todd for all the time and effort that you put in. And Ron, you stole my words because I was just going to say, and it didn't cost the city $400,000 to, to, <laughs> to do the obvious. Um, with all of the development that we're doing in the city, and there's little pockets of, of things going on all over. And we had one project come before us last week, and there were some people that were a little bit unhappy about the, the buffers encroaching on their property. This is something that stands to change the character of the city like no other project that we're working on, even the TPA, to put a major eight-lane highway. It's something the residents need to know about, and it's something that they need to get angry and take, take action on. Um, I, I was flabbergasted when I had my agenda review and saw the the presentation. I, I just, for the life of me, cannot figure out how, how and why this makes sense in any way. Um, I'm thinking about FPNL. We talked a little bit about the utilities. They are so tied up right now, trying to put half the state back together, and the county's going to ask them to move utility poles? I, I just... So... Yeah. Um. All right. Noted. We, we can sense your frustration. I understand. I do. Marcy. Um, thank you. I agree with what everybody said here on the dais. This is absolutely ludicrous. That's the first word that came to my mind when I st saw the presentation. Um, I agree with every comment that was made by the public. I moved here to Palm Beach Gardens. Um, about 20 years ago because I like the gardens aspect of the North County and that's why I came here and I do not want Southern Boulevard or Okeechobee Boulevard which is, I work one block from Okeechobee Boulevard and I used to live a, a, very close to Southern Boulevard and I moved here for a reason so I 100% agree with you. Um, it's taken no offense, Maria, because it's not your fault, but it's taken literally 10 years to put a turn lane at PGA and military. So that's one turn lane. <laughs> and, and it's not even done. We still have mast arms in the way. And I, I just, and, and that's a county project. And it started, we begged for that when I was on the council years ago, over a decade ago, and it's still not done. Um, We've had Richards Road, the Congress Avenue extension, on the five-year plan for 10 years. And that's not even been, or more, 20 years actually, two decades. And it's, it's, it's not done. And that's just one tiny little road right off of North Lake Boulevard. Small, small little extension. Uh, and, and so that's why ludicrous came to my mind. We didn't even talk about every single community that was mentioned. The majority of them have guard houses. They have stacking now that is already not enough. They need more stacking. And here we have 20, possibly 30 feet taking away from their already short stacking uh, abilities for their guard houses because they're gated communities. And that is a safe, a, a major welfare and safety issue because now they're going to stack onto a very busy road. You brought up turn lanes. This project or this right-of-way uh, taking didn't even account for any decel lanes, nor did it account for utilities, as they very well uh, stated. Those utility, I am literally spent four hours this morning working with AT&T to relocate a five-mile stretch of a main communication line, fiber optic line, and they are requiring 15 feet 
it was a 20 foot, it was a 10 foot, but now they need 15 feet of utilities along that stretch because so many communication companies want to be within the same utility. So that's just communication. That's not talking about FPL and, and any of the other utilities, Seacoast or any of the others. And they don't want to be, they can't be right on top of each other because we're in Florida and they, their lines would be underwater if they did that. So they need more room in width to get everything in there. So there's a whole nother aspect aspect of this that, I'm sorry, but David Ricks should know this because he's an engineer. So I just don't understand it. It makes no sense. I support 100% uh, of a special meeting if we need to bring other uh, people in here because I know it's short notice and I appreciate you all being here. Um, but it's important to get the word out because this affects so many of our communities, so many of our neighbors' communities um, that are outside of our um, city and also so many of the um, areas that are within the county, but they feel like they're in the gardens because they're unincorporated and they should know this as well. I'm also 100% in support of um, the mayor going to the county commission meeting and speaking on behalf of this entire council because I know she'll do an amazing job and uh, make our um, feelings known to them. and. I think that's about it, but um, I don't want to, I can keep going, but this is just so ridiculous. I, I don't want to go anymore. But thank you. I appreciate it very much. And thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thank you all so much. Um, 39 seconds left, may I ask a question? Patty? How do we, how do we I'm so sorry. We, have to, we do have to follow procedures. We can, what we can do is we'll have someone get with you so that we can answer your question at another time. Thank you, though. Um, I do want to summarize this because we have a whole agenda yet to get through. So we're still at the city manager report. What I just want to clarify for any of our residents that are now watching this or that will go back and watch the recording. We are here tonight because the county engineer, David Ricks, is bringing to the county commissioners the possibility of doing a study to widen North Lake Boulevard to eight lanes. That study would cost the taxpayers about half of a million dollars for a project that if you go back and watch that recording, he was um, went back and forth a little bit about the planning of what that project could actually be. So it was fuzzy. So a half a million dollars of taxpayer money for a study for what Mr. Ricks is calling a planning document. Because road widening, adding capacity does not decrease traffic. We've heard that it just puts more cars on the road. And if we're here to set policy to affect change on the quality of life and happiness for our residents to protect our economy and actually fix issues like affordable housing, resiliency, and mobility, this is the antithesis of how to get it done. Uh, we do need to come together, bring in our stakeholders. Thank you all for coming here tonight. And if we have the opportunity to provide a public meeting for full transparency, disclosure, and understanding, we will do it. We will keep an eye on the county commission agenda and the, hopefully we'll know well enough ahead to give our residents enough time to come and get educated. If not, we're going to utilize you guys to get that message out for us, get it out now. This method of um, roadway expansion is old fashioned. It's antiquated. And it is part of the reason why traffic here is so broken. So we need to shape the vision for what transportation will look like in the next 25 years. And it does not include paving over homes, paving over backyards, paving over businesses, and paving over paradise. So thank you, Ron, for bringing this. Um, may I ask you a question, Madam Mayor? Uh, is the western portion of North Lake Boulevard from um, uh, State Road 7 to Coconut, is it already approved for six lanes? And is it already engineered for such? OK, thank you. And a turn lane at uh, Osprey Isles, too, right? What's the status of that, actually, by the way? Natalie. <laughs> it's also funded. Okay. Avenir paid for All right, Todd. a job for that. I have a question. Maybe better off. All right. Yes. All right, so we're going to pull Brian Seymour. Will you state your name? And Just so happy I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Brian Seymour. Uh, I'm both a resident, but I'm also the lawyer for the property from which that turn lane is going to go. So nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> so um, I have actually spoken with uh, Tanya McConnell, who is, works for Avenir, who I know you all know. She used to be the deputy county attorney. Probably wouldn't be talking about this if she still was. Um, 
but the timing on that gave us about six months to try to get through our process, get it approval, but we'll end up dedicating the right of way for that. And then Avenir will um, include that in its construction of what the work they're doing for the North Lake widening. So the goal is to get here, get it there. We have to sum resubmit, by the way, it's all on us right now. Um, but we're, we've been talking with Todd, talking with Natalie, working through to try to make sure we can get that done in a time frame so that'll get built for uh, the folks at Osprey. Thank you very much. Any other, uh, Rochelle, did you want to ask another question or comment? One quick question. Um, since the section from the B line to State Road 7 is not part of this, and we have this whole B line North Lake reconfiguration by FDOT, where it's all going to funnel in right there. Have they weighed in? Have we reached out to them at all? What, how this is going to like upend their project? Because it's not going to work the way they're planning with this. Yeah, we haven't reached out to them. They're, they're, they're two separate projects. One is funded, one is designed, one is ready to go. The other one is a maybe 12 years, maybe never dream that the county's putting out there. So the DOT is going through what they have to do. So it, the, the two aren't going to coordinate because you can't design something that may happen 12 years in the future, you know. But they wouldn't weigh in on something like this, that, I, how, that it would be. I don't know that they would. They, they need, you know, their corridors to Beeline Highway and how it would converge with, with what the DOT is currently doing. The county would have to comply to the DOT standards there as they come into these intersections. Okay. You know, and, and one of the things looking at the right of way, they have the two U turns coming on North Lake Boulevard where it's only two lanes now. So that's taken a lot of width there. So there's really no more room to widen that choke section within West Palm Beach in the water catchment area on North Lake Boulevard. So that area gets really tight in there. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. So city manager report. Ron, anything else? Just a reminder, uh, Resolution 71 is on consent. Could we assume that by approving Resolution 71, the mayor would then be authorized also to sign the letter? Yes. I'm good with it. Okay. Do you want everyone to chime in on that? I'd like to hear it from everyone that if it would be unanimous if we uh, well, put why that don't we, on Why don't we pull it from the consent agenda so we can have a separate let's vote do that. to add a all little right. bit more So Mark's going to pull it. So let's move. Are we all set, Ron? I'll move on to consent. Thank so you, sir. I'd like to make a motion to accept the um, consent agenda minus Resolution 71 2022. Second. Thank you. Does, is anyone pulling anything else off of I'd consent? I'd like to pull number G, the key strategies and initiatives, off the consent. All right. Thank you so much. So, do I need to ask for another motion, Max, now that we've got two pulled? You want to just make an amended motion? Yep. Mark? I'll make an amended motion. I'll make an amended motion yeah, to accept the consent agenda minus uh, item G, resolution 64, 2022, and uh, resolution 71, 2022. All right. Can I'll I get a second? second? All right. Second. Great. Um, shall we bring it up for discussion or? Let's just vote on. All right. Let's vote on it. Um, vote, let's, vote uh, on. Vote on all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. So let's go ahead and. That was on consent. That was, that was on consent. The consent, consent that we just voted. So 71. Now we have Excuse to me, Mayor. 71. I need to read the title of 71. Yes, please. Resolution 71 2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, opposing the Palm Beach County's expenditure of up to $400,000 to commission a feasibility study for the implementation of thoroughfare right of way. I Identification map TIM, TE 14.1 for the North Lake Boulevard East Tim and the North Lake Boulevard West Tim, providing an effective date for other purposes. Oh, thank you. Oops. Here we go. Thank you, Patty. Is there any further discussion regarding Resolution 71? I, I do want to make sure that we clarify that um, with this resolution that the mayor is. Uh, permitted by the council to sign the letter. Thank you. That's exactly what I was just going to ask. With the <laughs> resolution. <laughs> yes. Go ahead and make the motion. Thank you, Marcy and Max. So I'll make a motion. motion. Uh, yes. Uh, for resolution 71 to approve resolution 71, including the mayor signing the letter that we've reviewed. I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you so much, Patty. 64. Bear with me. My agenda's a lot of paper tonight.
All right. So if I could ask the clerk to read the title for Resolution 64 2021, please. Resolution 64 2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopt, adopting PFM Group Consulting LLC's review of key strategies and initiatives 2022 as a council strategic plan providing an effective date for the purposes. Thank you. May I get a motion and a second to approve this item? Oh, we, oh, we have to discuss it. Sorry, Rochelle, you pulled it. Go ahead. We discuss first? Yeah, let's discuss it first, please. Um, so. Get a second? No, no. We're gonna, we can have a quick, do you want to do discussion or do you want to vote on it first? Does it we, matter? We can do discussion. Can just, All right, let's, let's do discussion. It. Please go ahead. We'll discuss it. Okay, so back in, in August, on August 17th, we had a presentation from uh, PFM on the, um, what is the official name of it? On the strategic plan. plan. Um, council is being asked tonight to adopt the report as a council strategic plan to help streamline a vision for the city's future. I think it was great that we went and had an outside company come in to look at what we're doing, how we're doing it, uh, and, and to give the city a checkup. I think it's equally great that we're already doing so much of what was recommended in the plan. Part of what was discussed, and I know because I brought it up at, at the workshop, was the data that was used in the plan was from 2019. And we have changed significantly since then. And if we had been asked to vote on it in 2019, it would have made sense. But right now, with the 2020 census, with taxable properties uh, increasing so much and our ad valorem numbers so much, and then lowering the millage rate and putting that in the 10-year plan with the budget, I just feel that we should have an addendum to the plan as written with the updated data to take into account where the city is now at the time that we are being asked to accept this as a council strategic plan for the future. And I wanted council's input on that. Um, so the part, I don't, I don't know, this is my misunderstanding. So the, um, the study was something separate. So would we be hiring that study group again to come up to add to it? Because we were accepting the study they provided for us. Is that like, you know, here is the study, right? So I don't understand how we could um, add an addendum to something that was provided as a, a whole unit. I don't, well, I, I had asked them at the, the meeting, he acknowledged that the numbers were no longer the same. And then we asked, okay, let's take a month, let's have it brought back before us. And I guess I expected to see something in there that acknowledged that update. Okay. I, and I, it's not there. So if I may let's add to that, because this is one of the items that I was gonna pull as well. Um, and to me, a strategic plan is, is a roadmap of the future. It defines the vision for the future. It includes goals and objectives um, going forward. And I love the uh, key strategies and initiative report. It was a great report. It was a great tool. And I appreciated everything that it was in there. Um, at the workshop, um, I recall that you had asked to do, uh, that you had asked for this to be included in, in a, um, as a, 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 a strategic plan, but I don't think that there was consensus from, by all of us to do that. Um, again, it was great, but in the report, um, it mentioned that we should assure community outreach, and that was mentioned numerous times in the report. Uh, I also um, think that you had mentioned, Rochelle, that not all of the stakeholders were part of it, that you asked about the residential communities and the business community was part of the stakeholders. So I'd like to at least have a discussion, a public workshop, not at this meeting, but a discussion on the future, on a future agenda um, item to do a little bit of public outreach and to bring in our business and our residential stakeholders, like we did kind of tonight on a different topic, to create a strategic plan because this particular report had questions, it had some suggestions, um, and 
Uh, in addition, the report was created, well, I said, by reviewing the stakeholders. So I do suggest that we table this for a future meeting and discuss it in more detail and provide some clear direction and goals to educate our residents um, and on subjects like strategic planning and annexation and expanding the TOD and surtax initiatives and parks and recreations. How do we see our city growing and bring our community leaders, uh, including ourselves, because we were not even um, uh, interviewed for this plan. And so I think that it would be nice if you know, we had a say in the matter as well. That's my take on it. Okay, Margaret Carl. I hadn't put much thought into it. Uh, I do agree with your last statement, Marcy. You know, when they came in and did the consulting and they did the report, I was uh, wondering why we as council members, as residents of the city that represent the residents of the city, why there wasn't any question to us, or at least a comment, okay, this is what's going on. Do you have any suggestions or thoughts? Um, I mean, the report was great. It obviously showed what, where the city should be moving forward. Uh, it is a couple years old, but it's always going to change. So, you know, I, I would assume that the city would be and the staff would be analyzing each of those initiatives on an annual basis as needs and circumstances change. Um, I, I, that would be my assumption. Uh, but and so this is a roadmap. It's not, you know, it's not hard set in stone, this is exactly what the city is going to do and this is exactly the way things are gonna go. So there has gotta be a lot of leeway in that and a lot of discussion as we move forward on each of these topics. Uh, I would like to see, um, I mean, as far as whether or not we wanna have another workshop and add more residents, I don't know, we didn't have anybody show up to the last one. So uh, that doesn't mean that we don't care about what people think, <laughs> but, but will we have an active amount of uh, engaged residents to, to be a part of it, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be opposed to having a workshop, um, one more or at least discussions, but if we do that, I really would like to make sure that the consultants speak to um, more of the residents, whether it's just the council or, or do something to, to make sure. I don't necessarily feel we have to do that, but if that's the direction that the council wants to go, then I'd support that. All right, Carl? Um. I think I'm a little ignorant on this one because um, I don't know what we're looking to change here by when we hired the consultant to come in, he, he gave us their, their opinion. It, would, it, was, it was really important to me to hear the consultant's um, opinion on the stability of the city, the way it's run, the vision, the direction we're going. And it, it brought me comfort, especially when we're talking about a $200 million budget and so on. And I kind of thought it ended there. Um, so forgive me if I don't, you guys might be look, looking beyond the outreach of the consultant that they hired at the moment. So I, I don't want to send the message back to the city manager specifically that every time he hires a consultant for something, the council's going to then blow it apart and then, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? I, I could be wrong, and I want someone to correct me because I, I left it as he was there at the podium that he met the goals and objectives of consulting for specifically what he was hired to do, and then that was the end of it. I and think, I didn't know it was supposed to blow up and go further, so I kind of left it alone, and this is right. the first I've heard. So the the intention of, of this study was to sort of put a pin in it. This is where we are. What I thought. Uh, this is what it looks like the future will be. I've yes. been, well, yes, this is what we've done. Where we are. Um, well, it's where they were when they finished the study, which is what it was hired for, right? So, so if past. you're freezing that moment in time and memorializing it with the goals in that moment, I, I was at the chamber all morning this morning working on the strategic plan for the chamber, which they redo. They did it five years ago, now they're doing it with a three year eye. And it's about, you know, we looked at the strategic plan from five years ago, not, like a third of it maybe happened. We don't have crystal balls. What I do see the study as being is, like I said, a moment in time for the city where on that day that it was submitted, that is how the city looked and that was what the future of the city looked like. 
what we could possibly consider, and this is completely off the cuff, is every two years we do a resident survey. That is one of the best places to get an idea of what our residents think about things. Perhaps that might be a way to fold in some of this knowledge and see what they think about it, because they're more likely to fill out a form online than they are going to come here at 7 o'clock at night on a Thursday, number one. So we can take that data combined with this data and not see this so much as a crystal ball to the future of our city, but perhaps see it more of, as it was, a review of key strategies and initiatives for our city in that moment in time. Because I, I spend a lot of my time c c communicating with residents on email, social media, phone calls, text messages, you name it. And getting someone to care about something so much as, as ephemeral as a strategic plan it's, it's so hard. So I don't want to lose the good work that was done in order to sharpen it, is my only concern. That's, that's where I'm coming my, from. And I think that's a great idea. I don't want to lose, I like that idea of folding the uh, resident survey, and, and I don't want to lose the data either. To me, this was a look on the past, not the future. Uh, well, and so I would like to take points of this, and I thought I it was- I thought it was, it was more so, of a- I of like this uh, report so much that I want to discuss it further and utilize the points that we all love in this and move it forward, but not I, I every have, aspect of I don't it. have the discussion over what's in here issues that, that Marcy has on that. I'm not feeling that way. What I'm feeling is if we're just accept, adopting the report as a report as of the city of 2019, it's one thing. I mean, COVID came in the way, we probably would have gotten it quicker and it would have been presented to us more timely without COVID. But we have changed, I mean, our financial situation has changed so much. The number of people that have moved into the city is gonna affect that housing part of the, of the plan dramatically. The, num the amount of, of money that we have coming in ad valorem now and the fact that we're able to have 10 years with, with the lower budget with the lower millage rate. I, mean, I, know. I just, without that being in there to accept it as a strategic plan for the future. But this was March of started. March of 2022. It wasn't 2019. A lot of the data well, came in. the but data it came in from yeah. 2019. But and, they and, on, and, the, and the census was coming out in 2020. Right, well the so, census is always gonna then, be 10 years behind so, though, so you, you, right. that, that's something so else we have to work So can I ask a question off. again? Oh, I'm, I just wanted a, a yeah. What's the goal of discussing this? Um, not disrespecting anything Rochelle's questioning, but by discussing this, where are we going with our, this discussion? What what's, change, what what's change the are nature? you hoping to effectuate? I just wanted to have, have council's input on accepting this as a plan going forward without an addendum on there. Like maybe that's the every two years we add an addendum. This is where we are financially right now and how that can, would fit in. Can we get some city manager input? Why Maybe you can help us accept the plan understand. as is what? and then up, update it in a certain period of time or something to Why to don't we table we it for this meeting because we have such a huge agenda and we can talk to the city manager about what we feel this should be for the next meeting. I need and some, then, I need, okay, I need Ron, staff input. Come on in, Ron. I like the plan. I have, I, I think they did a really good job I agree. Of, of picturing us. I, I just think, you. yeah, I, just, I, do I just thought we would talk about it more and be more a part of it. Well, I think Understood, the question, yeah. if I may, um, you know, th this was a, a consultant that brought in a, a, a strategic plan in my six year, five and a half years. This is the first one we've seen, which is great. The question is, what is the goal going forward? Are we going to do this more often? Do you want to have um, discussion, like the small little pockets? And say, next year, we're going to come back and say, okay, when we looked at the strategic plan, these are the things that we want to focus on and, and have a discussion on that as we go. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the. That's exactly. I don't know what, what are we, thought. what are we approving? It's, it's we a great. What are we doing? Like, it's a great plan. Okay, fine. We accept the findings of it, but what, what are we doing with it? Can we and, pause a second? I need the city manager to speak on this. He's heard enough of us. All right, Ron. So just, can you just point us? Please? Ron Ferris, please speak. Let's I'll all tell you what I know. Um, the plan was commissioned to check ourselves and make sure that we're doing the right thing, we're going in the right direction. Um, in meeting with staff and principal players throughout the community uh, to see whether or not 
the city was moving right with the TOD, the, the city's right with, you know. Our so it is a picture in time, but it's also discussions with staff members about where, where we see going to the future and with those uh, players that they communicated with to see if the city was online. Now, it was a report card. It was a discussion about where we might want to go in the future. It was a vision. It was established by standard criteria to use as a base of the information they had on 2020. Now, at the council meeting when we presented this information, it was to let you know that the study was done and here's what the study said. And it indicated that according to the study by the consultant, we were headed in the right direction. There was indications in this study that uh, annexation was in the future, that finances were good, the TOD is the right thing. And so basically it says, okay, you're considering the right things and you're going in the right direction. What it did not do, and which happens every year, it didn't tell you how to budget for the next following year. It didn't, it told you that the 10 year forecasting was a good forecasting tool. That changes every year. Population changes every year. Our goals can change every year. The allocation of funds and capital improvement to the different departments can change every year. There is no way you can get a strategic plan to get you that kind of detail to project those types of things. That's why you rely on your budget. That's why you lie, rely on your capital improvements. It is a picture in time that says you're headed in the right direction because the proof is in the pudding. Now, in the future, you have decisions to make. You have decisions to make on a budget. You have decisions to make on annexation. You have decisions to make on the TOD, whether we go tall, whether we go short, whether we have a train station, whether we don't. What is the transportation mobility inside that or not? That's a decision made by you all every year. We can't anticipate that into a strategic plan. That is an annual basis in which you all set priorities for this city through the budgeting process. This is not necessarily a visioning document per se. If you want a visioning document per se, then you're going to have to go out and hire a whole new consultant, spend a whole lot of money repeating what we just did. But that's your prerogative. And if you want to get the public involved, and dealing with charrettes and things like that, the public seems to be pretty well satisfied since they're not filling this chambers here telling you how dissatisfied they are with your leadership, with the annual process in which you provide leadership. You're their representative. If they were not happy with you of where you're taking this city, they would be here. Trust me, I've seen it. I know they will show up. So I think they're pretty much pleased with what you're doing. The picture in time says you're headed in the right direction, but on an annual basis, you set the policy. You can change that anytime you want. And all these other things will come to you as we can bring them to you. And that, again, is your policy decision that you will make, setting the vision and the strategies for the future. So to clarify, we have this moment in time that was captured by the study that we signed off on. We have uh, resident input every two years. We have a budget that we have our hands in deep, and so do our residents because they can find it online now, and it gets updated every night. And we also have a proactive caring staff that primarily lives in the gardens, and we have phenomenal representation. So I feel very much so like what Marcy is saying and what Rochelle is saying, I understand where you're coming from and I think it's because you're doing... Oh, oh, it's the name. Okay, so, so I understand where you're coming from and it's one of those things where we, 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 we don't have a meatloaf. We have a beautiful plate 
right? And on that plate, we have a couple of different pieces. So I think it's really hard to take all of that, turn it into a strategic plan that all of our residents, A, number one, want to even eat. Number two, that's digestible, right? But if you look at it in all the pieces of it, it's actually really, it's kind of all there. And I understand what you're saying about the, the name of it. I really do. I think that, that it's kind of hard to understand and wrap your brain around it. But we, we did hold a public meeting for it that was well noticed, and I don't think anybody came. That no, I, what, what are we voting on, though? Like, we're what, not. We're discussing it. I know, but oh, why are we voting on it? We're holding it in as a vision document. Remind you why yeah. you're voting on this. At the meeting, it was a council suggestion, not oh. staff. Council suggestion to bring this to the next meeting so that we can adopt it as our strategic plan in the word vision. That was you one asked council. that this come that was, before you that was, to that was, be adopted as. Yeah, that was okay, one so council. that was well, you know, leave it alone. Our that was that was my idea, my decision, because I thought it was very important to memorialize it as a vision document, as a document that captured the moment in time and where the city is headed for. So that anybody who cared to open up this giant document, which is on our website right now, they understood why it's just floating out there. What's the point of this just floating out there in the ethers? So it's to and give it definition and understanding. everyone agreed with you at that meeting, I might add, that it should come back and be adopted. So everyone said, yes, let's do that. Yeah, I have no problem I, adopting I the, the report. I have no problems with the report a at all. I just don't, didn't think a strategic plan should be on a consent agenda rubber, rubber stamped for nobody to, to, to see. And I felt like it also has a lot of questions going forward. In the report, they asked us questions that weren't answered So, so are, oh, for the future. And that's, that's where I... Are we, voting on to, are we voting on to leave Resolution 64 2022 alone or change something? Do you want to make a motion? She made the motion already, so... Okay, so I'm going to make a motion to leave Resolution 64 2022 alone on its face, if that matters. I'll second it. I'm fine with it. Just leave it alone as it is. So are you are you re are you Vote removing to, yeah. it from the uh, consent agenda? Make a motion to or approve it. it. Sorry. Approve it. To approve. All is. right. And do we have a second? I, I second it. That's All right. Fine. Let's take a, a name vote. So, Carl, are you in favor? Yes. Mark, are you in favor? Yes. Rochelle, are you in favor? Marcy, are you in favor? Yes. Uh, the mayor is in favor. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much for the conversation. And, and just, I think it's great that we're all thinking about it, and hopefully our residents pay attention to it, and hopefully the next survey that goes out will continue to give direction. And I would ask that, you know, for future, I won't be around, but uh, include the council and some of these consultants so that, the, you know, we are representatives of the residents. Um, it would be nice to have that question asked and see if there's anything specific that any council member has a you know, thing that they want to include. Noted. This is a representational democracy. We are meant to be here to be the voice of residents that can't be here because they trust us with that. So I really appreciate everyone taking the time to speak about this and have an open conversation. It's an honor to serve with you all. So let's move on to public hearings, right? Patty, I've, I've got a big pile of papers here, so you can tell me if I lost my place. So we are going to go on to our public hearing, and I'm going to read the quasi-judicial statement. So tonight we are holding quasi-judicial hearings on the following case, Resolution 58-2022, Panther National Master Plan. This means that the City Council is required by law to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official city file on this application, and any documents presented during this hearing. The Council is also required by law to cross-examine any witnesses who testify tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, and other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the order of the witnesses' appearances. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, please fill out a card and give it to the city clerk. The city clerk will now swear in all persons who intend to offer testimony this evening on any of these cases. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? All right, thank you so much. So I'm going to open the hearing. I'd like to please call Martin Fitz to the podium and Natalie Crowley. Hello. Uh, Mayor, 
Excuse me, I'm going to read Ordinance 10 by title. I'm going to read Ordinance 10 by title. All right, could you please read the title? Yes, ma'am. Ordinance 10, 2022, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78, Land Development Regulations at Section 78-159, Permitted Uses, Minor and Major Conditional Uses, and Prohibited Uses, by repealing subsection J61 and readopting same as revised. Further amending Chapter 78, Section 78-222, Transit Oriented Development TOD Overlay District, to create the Transit Oriented Development TOD Overlay District, providing for permitted, prohibited, and conditional uses and development criteria. Further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-751 definitions by adopting a new definition for active ground floor uses, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 78 land development shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you, Patty, for reading that. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, we don't have any comment cards, so let's go ahead. We have a presentation. Yes, ma'am, we do. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. For the record, my name is Martin Fitz, Planning and Zoning. And tonight I'll be giving a brief presentation on Ordinance 10, 2022. This is an, a land development regulations amendment to um, <clears throat> enact the Transit Oriented Development, or TOD, Overlay District that was approved in the Comprehensive Plan in 2020. This, the LDR amendment is to provide consistency for the comprehensive plan and to codify the elements that were previously approved already in objective 1.3.9. The 2D district is defined in the comprehensive plan as those parcels and projects that are within a half mile of the proposed rail station, which is tentatively located on the south side of PGA Boulevard and the west side of alternate A1A on the FEC railway corridor. The projects are specifically delineated within the comprehensive plan and are remunerated re in the LDR amendment as shown on the map here. The purpose and intent of the TOD district is to encourage development that is uh, supportive of transit um, uses and pedestrian oriented and mixed use centered on the regional transit station. And it also provides for densities that are supportive of mobility and transit. The standards that are included in the LDR amendment uh, are, are intended to codify the, the elements that are in the uh, comprehensive plan. And I will note that any, all the existing projects that are, are approved prior to, to October 16th will remain in effect and will not have to meet the uh, requirements of the LDR amendment. However, any new projects or redevelopment projects will have to meet the standards of the district. One thing that the LDR amendment specifically does is identify the uses that are permitted and prohibited within the district. Uh, for example, the passenger station is allowed as a permitted use within the TOD district and along with the, any standalone parking, whether garage or surface. Uh, previously, a passenger station would require a major conditional use. Also, the, the LDR amendments identifies specific uses that are prohibited within the TOD district. These are vehicle, I'm sorry, vehicle dependent uses, such as a drive through restaurant or drive through bank and car washes, and also uses that are not pedestrian oriented, such as a warehouse club or self storage. In order to be a truly transit oriented development, it, uh, a certain level of residential density is required. The comp plan established a base density of 15 dwelling units per acre uh, and also allowed for different uh, density bonuses uh, for the provision of workforce housing, or active ground floor uses, and, and other options. These options are already included in the comprehensive plan. This amendment simply codifies those and provides for the different criteria. Since uh, <clears throat> transit-oriented development is uh, intended to encourage mobility and transit use. Uh, the LDR amendment does allow for uh, developers to request reduced parking and provides for the criteria uh, for that approval. Additionally, uh, TOD is characterized by a mixture of uses, both within the um, individual buildings and within the project. So this, the LDR amendment codifies what 
and defines what active ground floor uses are and encourages those use and provides the criteria for, uh, for adding those. This amendment was, um, was noticed in compliance with our code. We provided uh, postings in the newspaper and also mailers to all of the individual property owners. And we also provided a courtesy copy of the amendment to the PGA Corridor Association. Uh, to date, we have not received any comments from the Corridor Association. We did, uh, for the board's notice, we did have a few people from the uh, residents within this area who did show up at the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board, and they did have a few questions, and I wanted to provide a summary of the answers that we had for those. This particular petition um, enacts the previously approved TOD district. Um, all the parcels and projects that are included in the TOD were already included through the comprehensive plan. No additional projects or parcels are being added through the LDR amendment. All previous approvals will remain in effect. There will, no project or parcel within the district is required to make any changes as a result of this LDR amendment. Only new projects or redevelopment will have to meet the standards of the, uh, of the criteria. Also, uh, the, none of the residential uh, projects are being required to have active ground floor uses uh, as they exist today. There would, no one will have to allow businesses to operate on their first floor. Also, there are no eminent domain uh, takings that are being approved with this uh, petition, and there are no, uh, no takings that are being considered as part of this. This approval also does not require projects to allow access for pedestrians or bicyclists through the project if they are not currently allowed to do so, and it also does not establish a specific location for the train station. This was heard, at, as I mentioned, at the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board in August, and it was recommended approval by a vote of 7-0, and staff recommends approval of Ordinance 10-2022 as presented on first reading, and staff is available if you have any questions. Thank you, Martin, and thank you for that summary slide. That was excellent. Appreciate that. So uh, let's see. We don't have anyone to speak, so I am going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Rochelle. I'll second. All right, Rochelle, go ahead made the motion do you have anything you want to talk about no like I said during the agenda review it, it's exciting to see the specifics of the TOD come to life and make it clear for the residents uh, what actually is going to happen there and what a TOD actually is for all the all the talk we've had about it um, most people don't really know and and I think this kind of lays it out and it's exciting to see it happen all right thank you anyone else have anything to say no? Well, um, I really like the fact that we're reducing the vehicle dependency within that area, making it very, very clear it's important because it's, you know, it's going to really push that multimodal activity. And we are walking the walk in our TOD for real now. So that is all I have to say. I thought that was kind of punny. So, okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you guys so much. Excellent. All right, moving on, we have uh, Patty, if you could please read the title for Ordinance 11. Ordinance 11, 2022, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78 land development at Section 78-54 public notice. By amending the public notice provisions set forth in Table 4 required public notice and by repealing subsection B2 and readopting same as revised, providing a conflicts clause, a sever severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much. So, hey, <laughs> fancy meeting you there. Okay, Martin Fitz is at the podium. Please go ahead. Hey again, for the record, Martin Fitz, Planning and Zoning. This is Ordinance 11, 2022. This is very much a housekeeping um, uh, amendment to, intended to uh, be consistent with the city charter amendments that were, were passed in 2018 and with state statutes. Uh, <clears throat> I will note that... Um, what this amendment does is basically does two things. The first is to make all of our public notice requirements for mail, mailers, and uh, property postings to be consistent and all be for 10 days. Currently, there's a, a bit of a variation there. The 10 days is consistent with the charter and with the state statutes. Also, I'll note that the state statutes do not require mail notice for, uh, for projects that are advertised in the newspaper. The city, however, is maintaining uh, mail notices in the interest of public awareness. 
as I mentioned, the text, uh, the text amendment basically just amends all of the public notice to be for 10 days. And also it <clears throat> reduces or removes the requirement for all public mailings for council meetings to be done at, as certified mail. So this removes a, uh, a requirement that was particularly onerous for, especially for large projects where it could be a very heavy expense. This was heard at the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board on September 13th, where it received a unanimous uh, vote of support, and staff recommends approval of Ordinance 11, 2022, as presented on first reading. Thank you so much. All right, we do not have any comment cards. Uh, let's go ahead and close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll Present make the motion time. to approve Ordinance 11, 2022, on first reading. All right, I'll second. Thank you, guys. All right, do we have any discussion at all? No, it's just a way to keep yeah. transparency open as best you can. Right? That's all we can do. And Talk about me. Somebody pays it's attention. All, yeah. all right. All right. So hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. And Martin, before you step down, congratulations on your promotion. Thank you very much, ma'am. Well deserved. All right. Next up, we have Ordinance 12. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 12, 2022, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 66, Taxation at Article 6, Economic Development and Valorum Tax Exemption, by repealing Section 66-310, Sunset Provision, and readopting same as revised, to renew the City Council's authority to grant property tax exemptions to certain qualified businesses pursuant to state law and the city, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 66 taxation shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for the purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to open the hearing. And tonight we're going to ask for our attorney, Max Lohman, to explain. Uh, this is very, very simple. Um, if you recall, um, a couple of months ago, um, the uh, voters, we had put a referendum question for the voters to ask them if they wanted to extend or reauthorize the town, the city council's authority to offer these tax exemptions. This has to be done by referendum. And they did, they voted in favor of that. And so this, you can see in section 66-310, what this ordinance does is it just simply strikes out the previous expiration date, which was November 6, 2022, and changes it to August 23rd, 2032. Um, You'll probably recall also that uh, the council has been very judicious and extremely responsible with uh, the issuance or the approval, if you will, rather, of uh, tax exemptions. We've only used it once in a decade, but it was very useful. Uh, it was used for carrier uh, to uh, help uh, draw them here and have their corporate headquarters here. And you've seen the, the magnificent building on the corner of Donald Ross Road and 995 that's in the city in Avenir, or Alton, rather. Um, and that was largely one of the reasons that it was brought here. One of the motivating factors for them was were those tax exemptions. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Max. I don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to close the hearing. May I please get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. All right. I'll second. Can I can I make a comment real quick? Yes, please. Um, I'd, I'd like to strike one line uh, in there about the whereas the current economic climate has resulted in high unemployment rate. And impacts the quality of the life for the citizens and sustainability of local businesses. And the reason I want to do that is I don't want that to be a um, possible um, requirement in future. If if future councils in the city in the future chooses to re-up on this uh, request of the residents to approve the council to have this opportunity to provide economic development, you know, look, the unemployment rate goes up and down all the time, but that's not the point. The point is that we want to encourage economic development in the city just for the sake of economic development in the city and, and trying to encourage businesses to come. That was written 10 years ago. Unemployment, whatever it is today, that is kind of irrelevant to me. I just don't want that to be a condition of pre-approval for future efforts. Noted. Is there anything we need to do to note that for the 10-year reference? For the second <laughs> reading, you're saying? Uh, we, if we take it out for second reading, that would be my, my, my request. Max, I'm totally in favor of that. That's fine. I'm good with that, too. If that's your desire to remove it for second reading, we can do that. Yes, please. I think so, Carl. Well, does, does it change it... the... No, I don't think so. No. No, it's that just a statement. Anything. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Max. So uh, can I get a motion and a second? Well, you to... have a motion and a second? Oh, I already do. Okay, so I'll, let's take a vote. Do we need to amend the motion because yeah. we've stricken them? 
No, I'll take the direction from the council by consensus. Okay. Thank you, Max. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Moving along, we have Ordinance 13. Patty, if you could please read the title. Ordinance 13, 2022, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 2 administration by repealing Section 2-294 bidding threshold and readopting same as revised in order to amend certain purchasing limits and remove certain reference to state law, providing that the remainder of Chapter 2 administration shall remain in full force and effect as previously enacted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you so much. I'd like to call on Max Lohman again, please. <clears throat> Basically, um, what this is doing is, if you, um, if you look at our, our charter, our charter specifies that the city manager has the ability to execute contracts, as it does, it also says the mayor. Our code does not. Um, so what this does is it codifies the contracting authority for the city manager. And um, we, right now, in the, in the code, it says $50,000, but it also refers to Chapter uh, 287, which is uh, uh, relevant to the CCNA, the Con uh, Consultants Competitive Negotiation Act, and talks about Level 3, which is $65,000. And they put that in there so that the, the bidding threshold would change with the times. Well, the state legislature doesn't really update that number as much as they should, but it's $65,000. We have to bid things out if there are more than $65,000 per our code unless there's some kind of reasonable exemption that we have in our, uh, in our purchasing policies. This ordinance provides um, consistency with our purchasing policies um, as well as changes that authority. Um, we still bid them out if they're $65,000. We have operated under the assumption that because it said if it was over $65,000, those projects uh, that were bid out had to be approved by council, that purchases under $65,000 could then be signed for by the city manager. We have um, been challenged and questioned by a couple of state agencies. One of them was DEO, uh, because our, at our currently our code doesn't say specifically that the city manager has the authority to execute a particular contract. And if you recall, we've had interlocal agreements where we have we have a, passed a resolution that allowed the city manager to execute interlocal agreements so long as we weren't expending any money. And so people were using that, uh, outside agencies were pushing that back at us and saying, well, can the city manager sign the contract? So we thought that it was prudent um, to bring forth an ordinance that would codify the authority to sign the contracts as well as codify and change the uh, purchasing authority. And Kumra can go into more detail about the purchasing authority, but we are proposing to change it from $65,000 to 0.5% of the approved budget. Um, that comes out to approximately a million dollars. And the reason being is because we've encountered um, increased costs over time, and sometimes our delays have cost us money. I, ended, I had inaccurately made reference in your agenda reviews to the winter of 19. It was actually the winter of 20. Going into 21 is when the uh, massive increases in construction costs started happening. Um, around December of 2020, um, and then leading into February and March of 2021, the, construct, the costs of structural steel and concrete uh, were, was going up weekly. Um, we have frequently had to execute letters of intent to secure purchasing positions, <clears throat> and companies have reluctantly accepted that from us. And what it's done is it's put the staff in a position to make promises that we couldn't necessarily keep that were dependent upon whether or not you guys approved it. Um, on, actually, tonight on the agenda, we had a couple of ambulances that had a letter of intent to hold the price until we could get to the point that you could approve it here. Um, and Kumra can talk to you in more detail. Good evening, Sister City Council. Um, for the record, Kumra, Purchasing and Contracts Director. I almost was about to sit down because Max was going to go through the whole thing. But All right, so he's addressed already the why and the wherefore of all of this. Um, it addresses issues with supply chain and the uh, logistics one we saw from COVID. Um, it mitigates our, our exposure to price increases due to those same kind of disruptions. It addresses issues caused by time delays because you only meet once a month. So that creates a problem for us that I get calls regularly from vendors who say, when is this going on the agenda? I said, they meet once a month, so you have to wait, right? So projects have to wait because we can't move forward until we have an executed contract. 
It saves the taxpayers money and improves the efficiency of the administrative operations of the city. It expedites the procurement process because we don't have to wait to get contracts approved. So it saves time. And of, of course, it does the other thing was to clarify the contracting authority of the city manager for certain government agencies. We have, I've had grants where the, where the agency, the government agency says, send me a copy of your, 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 your ordinance that says he has the authority to sign this. And when they get it, they says it doesn't really say that. It infers that, but it doesn't say that. So can you send, send me a copy of a contract you signed that has been approved? And I, I do that, and they take that. So this, this is, and that's just a Band-Aid. This would fix the problem instead of Band-Aiding it. Are there concerns? Yes, there are concerns. And a lot of those concerns were brought up during the agenda review. There's resistance to change. That is normal. That's, that's, that's a human emotion to be comfortable with certain things. And then when people put you outside of that, you say, I don't want to do that. But what I always think when it comes to change, because change is the only constant in the universe, is that if we didn't make changes, we'd still be living in caves. We'd still be living in caves, we would not have moved forward, and we would, not con we would not be able to call our city a progressive city. We'd still be living in caves. There are concerns about transparency. This does not change the competitive process. It doesn't, it doesn't change the fact we have to advertise in the Palm Beach Post. It doesn't change the fact that we send all our competitive solicitations, email them to the almost 1,000 vendors on our vendors list. It doesn't change the fact that we also use our e-procurement portal, Mercel, to advertise them to all over the country. I've gotten calls from people in India who have seen our solicitations and say, hey, can I, can I, can I bid on this? And I say, sure. You know? So it doesn't change any of that. And, and if you have concerns about the transparency process, we could, we, I offered that we could provide you with quarterly reports to say, these are the contracts that have been executed in the last 90 days. And I will, pre will present that to you, put that on the, in the agenda, so that people can click on the link and see everything. On our website now, we have a listing of all city contracts that I, that I update every single month. It lists when the contract was awarded, who it was awarded to, for how much, when does it expire, does it have any options to renew, or does it end at that date? All of that is there. So it doesn't, it, there's no issue of transparency. Accountability doesn't change that. We're still accountable to you, right? The Office of the City Manager is still accountable to you. We still have to send all our documents. When we do our solicitations, we send all our documents, copies, not because we are asked, not even because we are by law required to, because we want to be accountable and transparent. We send them to the Inspector General's office. Every time that we post an award recommendation or we have an addendum, Senator Paddy, and we send it to the Inspector General's office every single time. So nobody can say, hey, we didn't know you changed that or anything like that, right? It doesn't affect that we still have to abide by the procurement laws of the state. We still have to do that. It changes nothing. It doesn't change anything in our purchasing policy except the threshold at which a city manager can execute contracts. That's all it does. We still will have our own annual audit. The auditors come to me every year and they, they pull our contracts, they look at it, they ask questions, so they still do that. And we still have to respond to the general public. If the general public has questions, we still have to respond to that. And of course, we're always, we all work for city residents. Nothing of that changes, we're still accountable. The professional standards and the National Institute for Government and Purchasing and the National Procurement Institute are the preeminent public procurement membership organizations in the United States. And they have always advocated that if the budget is approved by the governing body, and, and in this case, what they mean is a line item budget. If you have a line item budget and you, and you list all the projects, and the city council, the governing body, approves these projects and approves the budget, there is no need for those to come back to council again to approve the contract after you've gone through the competitive solicitation process. There's no need to come back. And that's been their best practice advocation. In fact, when I do, 
I mean, I know you all like to come here sometimes when I get when we get awards for the purchasing department and say, hey, look at the purchasing department and all this and all. But there are criteria for all of that. And those criteria, one of those criteria is who has the authority to approve your contracts? Do you have to go back to, if you do line item budgeting, do you have to go back to council? And they have to answer yes. And that cost us 10 points every single year. It costs us 10 points out of a potential 200 points. It costs us 10 points because it is not a best practice with line item budgeting where you list all the projects to come back to the governing body and say, hey, can you now approve what you already approved the suspend? That makes no sense, right? Americans have a famous saying, famous statement by Neil Armstrong. He said, a small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. The giant leap would be that nothing comes back to council, right? If it's approved in the line item budget. If you approve it, which is your job, and you look at it and say, yes, we're going to build a new fire station, then there's no need to come, and we're going to spend $5 million to build a fire station. There's no need to come back and say, okay, how are the contract now for $5 million? That makes no sense, right? So that is what we call the giant leap. That would make us really progressive. But if you have concerns and you don't want to do this and, 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 and you want to, let's take a tiny step. The 0.5% is a tiny step. It's an incredibly tiny step. $65,000 that we all agreed is, is ridiculous. It's ludicrous. So the 0.5% or more is the small step for man, the small step for the city. Now, if you have any questions, I'm here. I can answer them. Kamra, that was one of the most passionate presentations you've ever given us. Never heard you talk so much. <laughs> very, very memorable. Can you sell my car? <laughs> no, thank you, though. Thank you for um, you're speaking from the heart and with so much professional acumen. It is noted and appreciated. Uh, let's see. So I don't have any comment cards. So uh, do we want to speak now, or should I go ahead and close it, and we'll talk after? Let's talk. All right. Carl, you're up. Oh, do you need a motion and a second? We can talk first, and then we can pass after. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna go ahead and, if you wanna take a motion, then you go ahead and close the public hearing. Okay, we'll do that. Public portion, and then uh, take your motion. Thank you. May I get a motion and a second, please? I'll make a motion on ordinance 13 I'll Carl? second. Michelle seconds. All righty, so I'm going to close the hearing. And now let's bring it back for some discussion. Carl, you make no, the motion. No, I don't care. Uh, okay, so. The small step is 0.5. What's the big step? Nothing comes back to you if it's approved. No, 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 no. Point, right. No, I get all that. Right. Do you want more than 0.5? That's my would question. Like nothing to come back to the council if it's already in the budget and you approve the project. Right. And 0.5 covers that. No. That's the giant leap. 0.5 is just a small step. So if you're uncomfortable with nothing, if you're uncomfortable, you say, no, we want to see certain things. And, and again, the city manager will still have the discretion for political sensitive projects to bring them back to you. The 0.5% okay. is, okay, if you don't want to walk 10 miles, will you walk a mile with me? Maybe you're misunderstanding. Okay, so 0.5% is, is a million of our 2 million, our 200 million. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you want points? 7% or is this? Oh, is... I want my, you want my personal opinion on this? Is yeah. That nothing should come back to you. Okay. I mean, I'm good with it. I mean, we got to put big boy, big boy pants on and let the, let the city do their business with, and if it, if it helps you streamline and be more efficient as a city, I think that's the goal. So I don't have a lot to talk about it. And if it, if it's less on the council's agenda, that's good. And if you can uh, approve stuff and keep things moving, I mean, I don't have a problem with it at all. Thank I was just wondering, is a million enough? All right, Rochelle is... Not okay. for me. Not for so, you. Okay. So Ordinance 13, as we've, we, we've called the motion and seconded it, is asking for 0.5% and 1 million. To put it out there for the residents in language that's easy to understand, this is not a blank checkbook for the city manager to write checks out of. Of the approved budget. Right. Okay, of the approved budget. You did a good job of explaining the other processes that we have to go to, and at agenda review, it was explained how many people actually have their hands and eyes on this before 
the city manager actually signs the check or the, the, uh, the form. Um, I like the idea of coming back to council, though, quarterly or sending us an official letter quarterly that has what was approved. Right. Report. Just so we we know and and can can have it there for question purposes. Absolutely. I don't see any problem with that. But otherwise, I agree that we need to move ahead. Um, we can't afford to slow things down and come back to us for stuff we've already approved. Thank you, Rochelle Marcy. Yep, I'm, I'm hop skipping. That's okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, Kumra, that was a very good speech you did. I appreciate that. Okay. And I'm so happy you're on our team. 100% happy that you're on our team. You've won a million awards, and we're very, very proud of that and proud of you and what you've accomplished. So um, I hear what you're saying. I also 100% agree that we need to increase the bidding threshold cap from $65,000. I think it's antiquated. I think it's not enough. I also agree with the fact that we have emergencies and we have to uh, obviously uh, deal with procurements during that time and definitely during those times we should have a, a higher cap as well. Um, however, I strongly feel that $1.1 million or $1 million is uh, too much. Um, we always talk about transparency. I know you talked about transparency, um, having a high cost item on the agenda, even if it's on consent, I feel that uh, it's the right thing to do. Um, it, our residents are not part of the, um, they're not on the vendors list. They don't pay any attention to vendors or the procurement process. Um, but they do see when items are on the agenda, they do see that it's on consent and they pay attention to some. Some of them do, some of them don't, but that's our job. Um, it's our fiduciary responsibility, in my opinion, to know what's being purchased, when it's being purchased, and for how much it's being purchased. And to me, that's just a big transparency and you can't put a dollar amount on that. The public hearing agenda is the best way to keep that transparency, in my opinion. Um, it gives people the opportunity to come to the meeting if they agree or don't agree or if they want to comment or at least to know what's going on. Um, we've had procurements appealed, I know, in the past. Um, it doesn't happen often, uh, but keeping the higher priced items uh, in public process, in my opinion, is important. I'd be much more comfortable um, approving the ordinance with a clear dollar amount uh, cap or threshold uh, by changing it from the 65 to $325,000, which is actually the level five threshold of the Florida Statutes 287. Um, that would cover the smaller items, not actually not just smaller items, but a lot of the construction items that are being done and a lot of the other items, uh, and items that need to be done in a timely manner, especially those that are being procured during uh, our construction processes for all of our capital improvement projects. Um, and I feel that we can revisit that cap um, with inflation in a timely manner, whether it be every year, every other year, we could do that. But um, that's my thought on the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Um, thanks for that comment, Marcy. I didn't realize Florida statutes had a limit level five for 325. No, it's, it's a not a limit. It's not a limit. It's just they have thresholds. They have thresholds. So yeah. it's, it's the highest threshold is what you're saying? One of the highest thresholds. Okay, so it, it, if I might, it, what, it, what, it, what she's referring to is CCNA. It's under the Competitive uh, Consultant Competitive Negotiation Act, and it's about how your it's it has to do specifically with procuring goods and services through um, certain professionals like engineers, landscape engineers, architects, and things like that. So it doesn't apply in any way, shape, or form to our normal procurement unless it involves CC the, uh, securing those services. So to be clear, the Florida statutes only control our purchasing process when it relates to the, the acquisition and, and use of those types of services from an engineer, an architect, landscape architect, there's a few other professionals listed there because you can't make them bid against themselves. So there's a very specific manner and method in which you have to procure those services and it also um, 287 addresses design build projects um, and design bid build. And then 255, chapter 255 specifically controls and preempts the field as it relates to public construction projects. All other procurements for a city 
are controlled purely by the city's purchasing policies. We are not required in any way, shape, or form under the law to bid anything outside of Chapter 255 and 287 other than auditors. So for that's a specific service. Um, so just to be clear, so what, you've done, what municipalities have done as a matter of best practice is they have procurement policies that require them to competitively solicit certain products because you're always trying to get the best price and you're always trying to get the best, most bang for your buck when you're doing requests for proposals. So I just wanted to make that clear so everybody understood because I didn't want you to labor under the illusion we were limited by that number some way. It's only related to CCNA and, and just as another point of clarification and I'll shut up. Um, Marcy, you, you had made reference that we're not increasing the bid threshold we're not increasing it's only the purchasing threshold threshold I just want to make it yeah clear no, I, I appreciate you making that reference and you're hundred percent right about the that and 287 was mentioned in the ordinance as well yeah okay so even though we don't fall into those categories or those requirements it's still kind of a rough number that's out there for those types of purchases so what other cities or counties or, or, or regions or municipalities in the area are following the same type of protocol we, we a couple of years ago on the NIGP listserv they had a they did a poll of all the cities to say and, and this is a poll not just of Florida but the whole US list your population and if you have to go back to city council and it was very disheartening to see people places like Leesburg or Koyi and and some of the transit areas saying, oh, we don't have, with populations less than Palm Beach Gardens, saying, no, if, it's, if we do line item budgeting, if it's approved, we don't have to go back. The only time we go back is if something comes up that is not in the budget or it's politically sensitive, and the chief administrative officer, in this case the city manager, thinks it, it, it's worth going back to council to approve this. Okay, so what's a typical percentage or what's a typical number for those that do require council oversight or, or final approval? Some have zero. Some have zero, some have 75,000. It varies it's all a across the range. Some really million no... dollars. My, when I was at Miami Day, we were doing, the, the director had a million dollars, I think it's something out of five million, and the county manager had two million dollars. It beggared the question for me that I asked the county manager, so you can, you can trust the director to sign a million dollar contract, but not a two million dollar contract, how you comp with that gap? That didn't make any sense to me. And, but they have that, and they have, over the years, raised it. I, 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 it's a tough one, because for me, it's all about transparency and it's all about making sure when you see a, a change from $65,000 to a million dollars, that just raises a red flag. And I, I know we had a discussion about this yesterday, so I appreciate very much you coming through it. My, my, my other problem, of course, is you know, we are charged with uh, approving a budget. It's a line item budget. I like to consider myself a budget person, and I couldn't tell you all the line items that we possibly approved in the year because there's a thousand of them that, that are going through. So, you know, for, for, for us to say, well, it's all there, you've approved the line item budget, and it's open to the residents to see, I, that's, that's a big question. It's a big question mark. And, and even, never mind for the general resident out there, but for us who are really supposed to be looking at these things. So that also makes it uncomfortable to say, well, you know, you approved the line item budget, and there you go. Um, now we're going to go ahead and do it. And, and I understand, I, but I do understand where you're coming from. Um, I don't know. I, I have to think about this. I, I, I wanted to hear what everybody else was saying about this. Uh, the other concern is not just my concern about what the residents are going to think about, you know, what we're doing, but how does this potentially put the city manager today and then in the future in a spot where they are suddenly looked upon as having too much authority, and now that puts the city manager and staff in a position to have to defend uh, that type of policy. So I'm not thinking about this just from my perspective, but you know, where does where does the resident come and look at this and say, wait a second, that's that's beyond the norm, um, and and that puts the city in a position to have to defend some <clears throat> of the purchasing policies that we've enacted. So you understand where I'm coming from? I absolutely understand your yeah. position. So I you know, I, I read it last week. I read it over the weekend. I thought about it. We had to talk about it yesterday. I was curious to hear what everyone was going to say. Um, 
And you know, this is first reading, so we have a little bit of time, I have more time to digest it. Uh, but um, that, those are my concerns, and, and I just wanted to share them with everybody. And, uh, and if I may, remember you have the opportunity to make a suggestion for a modification to the ordinance to, to, to satisfy any concerns you have. Rochelle. Yeah, I had, to, to what Mark said, I had actually had the question before he, he brought up the fact that there are a lot of lines in the budget. Is there any way to highlight in the budget the line items that would fall within this purview? So when we are doing the budget, we, we know when we're going through that this is something that, that the city manager is going to be able to do on his own. That's an Alan question. Is that a, a major thing <clears throat> to like color code it or, or highlight them? Well, I think there's it? so many line items in the budget. As was mentioned, there are about a thousand line items. It would be practically impractical to highlight. I mean, you'd have to highlight every single account basically because it, any purchase could be coming out of any type of repair, maintenance, or contractual service, or our CIP projects. So it'd be very difficult to do. Now, the, 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 the comment about, you know, every quarter submitting, you know, the, the, um, the purchases that were, you know, fell into this, this purview is, is one step in a good direction. But by that time, it's already been approved. Or signed well, off we, we on. could do that before too. We could we do could it in advance of. We could put a, a, a report online, and we could give you a report every month, once a month, telling you these are the projects we're working on, and this is the estimated okay. cost for those projects. And if you want to put that online, because yeah. nothing we do here is classified. Right, right. It's open. You know, we can put it online. Anybody can go look at it. I'm just trying to make sure that our residents have transparency and they can see it, and we can see it, so that. There's never a question that somebody is doing something uh, that may feel like it's not in the right interest of the city. So that's my biggest concern. And I appreciate you having that consideration. If you say, hey, quarter Q2 of 2022 or 2023 or 2024, these are the things that we're going to be looking at uh, purchasing. Um, here, here it is, uh, submitted to the council, put it on consent agenda. We, it's there, and then we can approve it, and then up goes. Um, to, to, to allow for that expedited um, timeline. I think that would make me feel better. All right, real quick, I had Rochelle and then Carl and then Marcy. So go ahead. Right, you had a question? I just said that was a, uh, an interesting solution. Okay, so I then understand. Carl, and then we'll come back to that. So <clears throat> put a pin in that. So Carl had, was waiting. Um, okay, I, I kind of get where everybody's coming from, but I don't know if we should be hypersensitive because you're approving a $5,000 contract for someone to mow the grass I mean it's 5% of the approved budget 0.5 sorry so to simplify things when did okay so when did the uh, the initial $65,000 start what year was that or how long ago was that I came here in 2012 that came in 2012 I think I started here and, the, the, um... and it was like two years after that or so they changed it Right, it was $50,000 in the code um, prior to my arrival, and it had the reference in the 280, in Chapter 287 to the CCNA um, so that to, to the Category 3 purchasing threshold under CCNA so that ostensibly it would um, be increased on a regular basis. But again, the Florida legislature sometimes, um, things like that, they don't move on that much. I mean, keep in mind that, um, uh, you know, I think grand larceny is still 300 bucks. That's a felony. I mean, really, $301 and it's a felony? That's insanely low. Um, but it's, so they don't really change these numbers as frequently as one might think they should. You know, so you look at um, the, the CCNA number here, it, it went from 50,000 to 65,000. I've been doing this for almost 20 years. It has changed exactly one time. So what I don't want the council to do is get into the weeds of what $1 million is and, and get into the efficiency of how you can, or the city manager can approve something along within the month instead of having come back to council, which not one of them or one of us knows what line item was approved in any given month. And what's it gonna change? Absolutely nothing. And the state, we, we all trust Ron. If it was another city manager, 
and I talked to Ron about this. I was think I was thinking about putting in some. Oh, hold on. I was oh, hold on. I was asking, is there a way we can put um, like a, some safety net in there? We can't by law, but it's up to the city council, whether it's us or whether it's the next city council, to monitor the city manager. And if the city manager's not doing his job, you get another one. Yeah. So I want to. I, I don't want the council to get involved, my friends, to get involved in you approving or the city manager approving um, air condition approval because they won't even never know it was approved anyway. And you guys are going to move it along quickly. So I don't think giving you 0.5%, $1 million, and that will, that's relative to, to whatever year it is, whether we're in a, a drought year or, or, or prosperous. Um, I just think that it just helps the city run more efficient and if you guys get into the weeds of it, you're not going to know what line items approved anyway because it's already 0.5% of the approved budget that we already signed off on. So that's my, I'm going to, I'm going to support it because it makes sense. We want the city to run efficiently and that's how I feel. Okay, Mark, will you reiterate what you said for Mercy, please? Well, I'm sorry, what did you ask? You, said you had a suggestion, and then Rochelle said that's a good suggestion. I didn't well, so what you were when saying. when we were having this conversation yesterday during my agenda review, Kumara said, "Well, if you want, we can. We, one thing we can do is just list these items that are going to be purchased or have been purchased, and and just put them on consent, and so you can see them, uh, you know, after the fact, and we can do it monthly, quarterly, whatever. And then, but the problem with that is that if we're going to go through this conversation, then you've already, then the money's already been spent, and you you haven't had a chance to." If anybody ever wanted to vet it, you've already missed your opportunity. To, and then we've to got a consent page that's four so, pages long. It's already but there. But that's a matter. Because, so, so yeah. in, in, on the other side of that, if you said, well, hey, every month or every quarter, this is what's coming up next month. These are the items that are going to fall under this category. They're in consent. You can look at them if you want. And that way, we don't have to wait for an actual approval after the fact. So you would be able to list the, um, the purchase items in advance of the actual expenditure, and that way the council or the public has an opportunity to see what's coming, um, and that way it's already that way you had a chance to see it. Yeah, and and I, I don't have an issue that I think that's a lot for staff, but um, I feel like just increasing the it, it would be hard because they might not know that far in advance, but they might. I just feel like that's a lot of work for staff to do. However, what what is what I is, feel like if we just raise the cap from 65 to even half a million now we can always readdress it next year that's fine too just yeah, to Mar Marcia, but we're not north palm or we're not juno you know i i, I would get 365 or 400 for juno I beach or understand. you know jupiter inlet colony but not not a a city that's got 65,000 residences and and lots of city land and uh, you know uh, yeah i just think a million I don't think one has fits. anything to do with the other it's about uh expenditures and transparency is what I well, have and, the issue with. And what so. Kumrad, what we could do for the reports, because Kumrad does these anyway, is, um, like I said, it could be either monthly or quarterly. Quarterly is a little more efficient for him, but he's super efficient anyway. But the, the I mean, he could, um, he can provide, because we post all these acquisitions on, on our website anyway, um, but he could provide a report to you quarterly, and it could either be part of your agenda package, it could be part sent to you individually. It's already on the website, but he could provide that uh, provide that to you. And one of the things that you, you might want to keep in mind, too, when it comes to the purchasing uh, authority, the city manager's authority to pay employees is exempt from this ordinance, and it is exempt um, from any purchasing authority. And I, th and I think we spend somewhere, uh, how many, I don't know how many millions of dollars that he actually authorizes the expenditure of every two weeks, but I know that it's well, it's well over seven figures um, to pay all the employees. And he has the, he has the singular authority on, as the city manager to whatever he's got in the budget as far as employees, he could terminate 50 employees and decide to pay somebody a half a million dollars. And that's completely within his discretion. Not that he would do that, but it's like, just to keep in mind right? though, that money gets expended every two weeks at, with his authorization. We also spend multi-million dollars annually on utilities, and those utility bills sure. never come to you. Same thing for insurance. Millions. Um, it's millions of dollars, and those things don't come to you for your approval. So it's just to, just to keep in mind. I'm not trying to throw stones here. I'm just trying to make you aware. 
All right, may I, anyone else? I'm more than happy to continue this conversation. So, um, I love setting policy. And when you think about setting policy, we're not talking about what's happening right now, we're talking about what's happening next year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. That said, whatever we set could go away the next day with the next council that comes in. I, I, my heart goes out to all the staff that you guys present stuff to us and we might not have a clue about it and poof, it goes away. So um, nonetheless, what you said actually stuck with me more than I realized it would. And our consent, on consent tonight, we approved, um, and bear with me because I don't have my reading glasses, a payment of over $2.1 million for two ambulances, three ambulances that we won't see for 30 months right. uh, because of supply chain anyway, right? So, and you mentioned very politely that there was an issue with even procuring that because you had to get a letter of intent, right. which is not their policy. So we're already waiting three years for ambulances that we need that are costing $2 million and we have a huge budget and also every single thing that you process is on our website for anyone to see. Every single contract is on the website within one month. So even if you do have to give us a quarterly report or a monthly report, you're gonna just literally just we just open up the website and it'll be there. Just so. extract it from it and send it to you. It's easy. So that, that to me sounds like transparency. And if you're talking about an 8% increase in um, inflation every year for all of us, right? And we're looking at a number, was it 2012 that this was set? I'm sorry, I forgot what the number was for the 65,000. It was, um, it was, it actually was even before Kumra got here that, that the CCNA number had increased to 65 from 50 and it was, um, I think it was in 08, 09 and hasn't changed since. So we're setting our salaries every year to match inflation, COLA and things like that, but we're not setting this th threshold, which, you know, three ambulances is 2.1, 2.2 million dollars. Oh my goodness. So, I mean, and also when I grew up, I thought a million dollar house looked like a palace. Now it's, you know, two, two and a half bedrooms and two baths and, you know, zero lot lines. So things have changed. A million dollars is not the same a million dollars that it was when we wrote this. So I'm going to just go for this. And I'm going to say that I'm in support of allowing our staff, Kim Ra, for you for now. And then the policy that would go forward to go forward with that. As you said before, you've, you've actually won all these awards despite the 10 points that get taken off because you don't have the authority. So we're not even giving you that authority. Oh, we're but not, me. not me. Oh, not you, not you personally, I mean, okay. the process. I apologize, Never, not you. <laughs> but we're not even giving, you're still gonna get the 10 points taken off because you're, we're capping you at a million. So right. we're, we're not, you're, you're moonshot, you're still, you're still here. Yeah, one, um, one so small step. I, I hear you, and I really did hear you. So I'm in support of allowing Kim Ron, our purchasing dis, um, department, the ability to efficiently keep our fiscal responsibility. So I'm going to go uh, and see if I can get a motion in a second to see if we can go forward with it at, at Thanks. point five. You actually have a motion. I have a motion in a second. second. All right, I'm, do, do, a do you line, want to vote? Do a line vote, please. Uh, do, yeah, my vote by name. So here we go. I will start with Carl, yay or nay. Mark. I'm going to say yay today, but I do want to have some further conversations with you. Yay for today. Got it. Rochelle. Yay for me. Marcy. Nay. And I'm a yay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right. So the uh, first reading passes of a vote of four to one. If I could have the clerk read the title for Ordinance 14, 2022. Ordinance 14, 2022, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending the City of Palm Beach Gardens budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2021 and ending September 30, 2022, inclusive, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. I'm going to open the hearing, and I see Alan Owens is at the podium. Hi, Alan. <clears throat> Hello, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. For the record, Alan Owens, Finance Administrator. Ordinance 14 is a very simple uh, amendment. It's a basically housekeeping item. What we're doing is amending the fiscal year 21-22 budget for two line items to reflect the accounting transactions that had to be made to re uh, post the um, capital lease purchase of a 100-foot sea grave ladder truck. Uh, council approved that item in April of 2021. 
as you know, it takes quite a while for these things to be built. So we just recently uh, received the, uh, the truck. And the way this agreement worked is that the Truist, who is a financing institution, held the money in escrow. And once it's delivered to us, they release the funds to us. And then we, in turn, pay the vendor. So what we have to do, since we booked those in expenditure and then an offsetting revenue, we have to amend the budget just to to get the budget to match the expenditure. So there is no impact on fund balance. The only impact on fund balance will be over the next 10 year period when we budget and pay the debt service. Um, just as a, a side note, uh, this is just a, one amendment to the fiscal year ending in 2022. We're still working on the uh, big amendment that we normally bring to council around three months after the end of the year and we're working on that right now. This is where we put together all the projects and open balances on purchase orders to be carried over and we adjust the beginning fund balance to actual. So that'll be coming for to you in the next three months or so. Just wanted to mention that. And staff recommends approval. Okay, thank you. We appreciate that and we'll see you within the next quarter for the housekeeping that we all expect. So we don't have anyone really wishing to speak. No, all right. So I'm going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 14, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. The motion passes 5-0. Let's move on to Resolution 58. If the clerk could please read the title. Resolution 58, 2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving a master site plan amendment to add 24 dwelling units to the Panther National Master Plan within the Avenir Plan Community Development PCD that is generally located on the west side of Coconut Boulevard, approximately 0 0.9 miles north of the intersection of Avenir Drive and Coconut Boulevard, as more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing an effective date for other purposes. I'm going to open the hearing. Do I have any ex parte? All right, no, none. none. All right, seeing none, we have our petitioner. I think we have Scott Hedge from Panther National. What, what, do, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your patience tonight. We had a heavy lift. We appreciate your being so kind and waiting. Go ahead. All Don't right. feel bad, we put you next to last. <laughs> have, have you been sworn in? I All have. right, great. Good evening, for Thank the record. You. My name is George Missimer here tonight on behalf of the applicant and property owner, and I have been sworn in. Uh, we'll make it short and sweet tonight. Um, we are here for the Panther National Community, an amendment to our master plan to approve the addition of 24 dwelling units to that master plan uh, for Resolution 58. Uh, I'm sure you all remember the location of the property within Avenir. Uh, north of North Lake Boulevard and west of the B-Line. Uh, we are in the northwestern portion of Avenir. Uh, we were approved with 218 dwelling units, so adding the 24 gets us to 242. Uh, these units are proposed as villas, which would be located on the clubhouse, uh, lifestyle center, and sales center tracks, and those would need to come back as final site plans uh, to be approved uh, we're working through those designs now and uh, hope to bring those in the near future. Uh, as part of our uh, amended master plan, we did adjust the maintenance area and uh, made sure that we are including a buffer on the internal portion of the maintenance area to make sure that we're uh, buffering all sides, uh, for both internally and externally. Uh, again, all the numbers are staying the same. We're just adding those 24 uh, units to the overall count. Uh, brings us to about 0.6 units per acre. Again, again, here is the updated master plan. Uh, basically, the only thing that changed, again, was the site data, including those additional units. Uh, as part of the amendment, we are proposing an addendum to the uh, Panther National Design Guidelines for the design criteria for these villa units. Uh, we are uh, designing these with a couple different options, but uh, the requirements are consistent with all land development regulations, and we're providing for those material theme palettes, colors, and it's all very consistent with the architectural designs that were previously approved for the single family homes. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have a staff presentation tonight? 
No additional staff presentation. Staff Thank recommends you. approval. Thank you very much. We don't have anyone wishing to speak and no comment cards. So if we could, I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make the motion to approve Resolution 58-2022. I'll second. All right. Any, for any discussion at all? I think that was anyone. Scott, Ready? just do me a favor and just, like, for me personally, on all this stuff that, we, that I sign off, I like to look at it. So I know I go through <laughs> Avenir. We, I, I just I toured our, our par three. Some of these buildings that we've built around, you, you know, I'm, I'm constantly, I'm, I'm doing it here, and then I'll watch it go up. So when you can reach out to us and take, let us go back in there and see what you're doing. We were looking at Avenir while it was still dirt. All of us were going back in there on four-wheel drive trucks. And so invite us out so we can live the vision with you because we're a part of it. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, can you please speak into the microphone? I apologize. Um, yeah. Panther is, is, it is very much on, um, on the way. If you have a chance to drive back there, you know, we're hidden in the back of uh, Avenir, but <laughs> just turn the, the last circle and look north, and the, the large hill in the back is Panther National, and we're moving over 1.6 million cubic yards of, of fill to just get the golf course shaped to where we, we want it. So, uh, Mark and I want to see where we're going to play. Yeah, <laughs> as, as soon as my goodness. It, get it moving in that direction, <laughs> we'll definitely have everybody out there and appreciate all your support. I think obviously. it's private. Okay. Can, I, can I afford one of these villas? Or is that still <laughs> well, yeah. no. Scott, if you invite us, we might not leave. So, <laughs> Can you give us any indication on, on where the units are going to go? Do you have any idea which parcel you're more inclined to put them on at this point? Um, right now, the clubhouse and the lifestyle center the, in the core. In the core. And so that way it's, it's closer to the amenities, you know, and um, within the, the pools and, the, and the, the areas that will be amenitized. And it will be able to bring in a different product line into Panther. We only have 200 units, so this allows us to have another offering, if you will, within the project. And, and I'm sorry. No, and, please. And this was, and you did say yesterday, Natalie, that this doesn't increase the total number of units in Avenue as a whole. It's just kind of shifting things around. Okay. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. All right, that's a great point. Thank you, Mark. All right, so Scott, thank you so much. We think this is a brilliant idea to put these villas in here. So I'd like to go ahead and take a vote. May I, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, guys. All right, we are moving on to resolutions. Patty, would you please read the title for resolution 49? Resolution 49, 2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of regular members to the Art and Public Places Advisory Board, providing an effective date for the purposes. All right, thank you. I don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to go ahead and get a motion in a second so that we can discuss. I can take a stab at it if you want. I'd like to make a motion to reappoint Cynthia Maronet. I hope I get their names Marinette. right. Marinette, sorry. Nancy Sims and keep Edward Penza as alternate one and Mary O'Brien as alternate two and the rest of the board remains the same. May I I'll get a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? No. Okay, all in, I see Mark touching his microphone. Is that, no, okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes, 5-0. And I will tell you, Cynthia Marinette is shown herself to be very helpful, Jen O'Brien as well. This is a really good, uh, a good board. I've heard great stuff coming out of them so far, so that's great. Uh, Patty, we're going to move on to Resolution 50, please. Resolution 50, 2022, Resolution of the City Council of City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of regular and alternate members to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, providing an effective date for the purposes. All right, thank you very much. I don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to Make a motion. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask for a motion. Does anyone have a list of names or anything you want to go forward? Um, all right. If not, I'm happy to provide the, I can provide a list that I have ready to go. I can make them. Carl makes a motion. Okay. All right, Carl. I'll do it. I'm in favor of, uh, I'm sorry, lazy, hold on. Uh, I'm in favor with leaving Bobby Wonderlich on, Matthew Kamala, and the alternate Ron uh, Meckel Coney, I don't know, and Faith Meyer. Faith Meyer, yeah. Do we need to say Let's who goes to the where? List. Yeah. That 
point I'm Matthew happy. Kamala as a regular board member? Does that need to be stated? I'm, I'm happy to list he, it. He's under the regular board. board. Max, right. do we have to list all the names in order? However, they're, however they're listed. They're listed like that. As they're listed on the exhibit, because there'll be an exhibit to the resolution. Correct. Okay, as listed on the exhibit. So did I need a second? Well, he's Anyone else? alternate, but he's moving up, right? Right. Say Rochelle. So, yes. Well, so, so to, listed as alternate, and then he's moving up though onto the board. Yes. Yeah, so right. Then, so Matthew Cam Cam Camilla is going to be moving from first art alternate to be appointed to the board. Ron, I don't have my glasses. Macaone Mac <laughs> uh -huh. would be moving up to first alternate, and Faith Meyer will be moving into second alternate. Yes. Correct. Are we good? Correct. Yes. yes. All right. Lovely. Let's uh, let's vote. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Wait, do we have a, do we have a second? Have a second? Huh. Yeah. Do we get a second? I apologize. I sort I'll of jumped in. Thank you, Mark. My, my mistake. All in favor again. Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? No. Nope. Motion passes 5 0. Zoning, my favorite. No offense. I know Mark was budget. So, Patty, if you could read Resolution 51, please. Resolution 51 2022, Resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of regular and alternate members to the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board, providing an effective date for other purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we go, I do want to mention that Nadia Spivak, who is on the list for an application, has joined us this evening. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, let's see. So um, I don't have any comment cards. We can go ahead. Is it okay if we do? Uh, do you guys want to do it as a motion, or do you want to discuss it first? I'll motion it again if you want. Motion. Thank you, Carl. Go sure for I'm it. Better. All right, yep. regular members, Zachary, Zachary Seth Mansfield, Charles Miller. What? Where are you? So, what? Millar, sorry. Sorry. Uh -huh. Christopher <laughs> Offerdahl, Timothy Copage, Randolph Hansen, alternate member, first alternate member, Linda Hess, and second alternate member, Nadia Spivak. Spivak? Spivak. Spivak? No, I'll second. That's my motion. Okay. Motion. Wonderful. That's seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Welcome to the boards, everybody. Thank you for being here. Next item for council discussion. Uh, anything anyone else wants to talk about besides Broncos? Broncos, I know Broncos have been on for almost thirty minutes. We're working on it. Half time yet? Uh, it's not half time yet. Marcy, thank you for the snacks tonight. And Max, do you have a, a report tonight? Uh, not a chance. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys, we did it. It's not yet nine o'clock. If there's no, I, I was, I was over. I thought we'd go over nine. I didn't weigh in. I can wait one more minute so that I win the bet. No, okay. All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.